Good morning, everyone. Am I audible? And is my slide moving? So, myself, Dr. Beth Prakash, I have completed my DRNB in surgical oncology and I'm a consultant surgical oncologist. So, we have designed this platform and this platform will run like we'll be doing one topic every one week. So, this week we are doing breast and then the following week we'll be doing basics of general surgery. After that, thyroid, parathyroid, and adrenal gland. And after three topic, we'll be doing a doubt, a doubt clearing session and mock test on our platform. Similarly, uh, we'll be doing another three topic and again doubt clearing sex, uh, session for all those previous chapters. So this is how this platform is run. And the highlight of this platform is that one system every class every one week. And the class will be on Sunday so that everyone of us can attend it easily, even if we are working. Recordings will be provided. Slides will also be provided on our website. The doubt clearing session will be every month for three preceding systems. And we have ample time for study. We have exclusive WhatsApp group and revision of preceding systems will be accordingly. And also we have mock test, image-based questions will be included, Savistan Bailey swords all covered, and the screenshot of the references are provided on those mocks, mock test. So this class is based on all these textbook that is Bailey, Savistan, Swartz, Devita, which is Bible of Surgical Oncologist, and of course, NCCN guideline. So we'll begin our topic today. The anatomy of, we'll begin with anatomy. So we all know breast is a modified sweat gland. Now, the gross extent, what we see is less than the surgical extent. The surgical extent is larger than the gross extent. People are joining in between. So the surgical extent is from clavicle superiorly and Inferiorly, it is seven to a three, while the gross extent, which is smaller than the surgical extent, extends above from the second rib to the uh, below sixth rib. And the medial extent is also smaller, that is from lateral border of the sternum to the anterior axillary line, while the surgical extent is larger because superiorly it will begin from the clavicle and inferiorly it will go up to the 7th and 8th rib and medially uh, it is in the midline and laterally it is along the anterior border of the latissimus dorsi muscle. Breast is basically made up of terminal ductal lobular unit. It is the basic structural unit of the mammary gland and there are 10 to 100 lobules in one breast and all of them will empty into the 50 to 20 lactiferous duct, and all these will open into the nipple. Now, involvement of this lactiferous duct is responsible for nipple retraction, while involvement of upper ligament is the is the reason for dimpling and tethering of the skin. So, upper ligament is nothing but it is fibrous tissue attached from the overlying skin to the underlying deep fossa of the pectoralis major muscle. Areola 
contains both sweat glands and sebaceous gland and in the pregnancy and lactation it is more functional and it is enlarged and that is known as Montgomery tubercles. Now though there is, uh, there is a, a classification called uh, invasive ductal cancer and invasive lobular cancer but it doesn't mean that the invasive ductal cancer will originate from the duct and invasive lobular cancer will originate from the lobule. In fact, both of them will originate from the terminal ductal lobular unit. It will function as a unit. Now, uh, shortly we'll uh, discuss about the blood supply of the uh, breast because uh, in the entrance they make it all except. So these are the major vessels that supply the breast. The arterial supply is via superior thoracic artery, acromial thoracic artery, and the lateral thoracic artery. These are the branches of the axillary artery. And we have medially this internal mammary artery which gives rise to the uh, intercostal artery which also supplies the breast. The venous drainage of breast is uh, basically via these three major tributaries that is internal mammary vein, axillary vein through those branches that we discussed and the intercostal vein. The reason why I am discussing all these uh, blood vessels supply because they have implications in the management of breast cancer. The intercostal vein that we saw in the previous slide will drain into the posterior intercostal vein. You can see along this, you can see along this laser pointer, this posterior intercostal vein will then drain into the paravertebral plexus. And these paravertebral plexus will drain into Batson plexus and ultimately into the lumbar and vertebral veins, which are responsible for the dissemination of the tumor cells from the breast into the lumbar vertebrae. And that is the reason why the most common site of metastasis in case of breast cancer is lumbar vertebrae. Similarly, uh, this is the uh, inferior drainage. Similarly, via Batson plexus, it will disseminate to the dural sinuses and, and this is the reason for leptomeningeal metastasis in case of breast cancer, that is brain metastasis. So uh, after blood supply, we will be discussing lymphatic drainage because the entire carcinoma will be, carcinoma management will be based on lymphatic supply. Now the lymphatic drainage of uh, breast will begin from the skin. The, well, in, be it any quadrant of the breast, the skin of the breast will drain into the subareolar plexus, that is sapes plexus. And from this sapes plexus, the drainage will be into the breast parenchyma lymphatics, that is known as perilobular and interlobular lymphatics. And through this uh, uh, lymphatics, it will then finally drain into the axillary lymph nodes and there are several axillary lymph nodes, one, two, three groups we'll be discussing. And this is the reason why the tumor may be in any of the quadrant, but the sentinel, sentinel lymph node biopsy that we do during the procedure will be injecting the methylene blue into this subareolar area because ultimately the, ultimately the Lymphatic supply will come into the subareolar plexus of SAPE and that it will drain into the axillary and internal mammary lymph nodes. The entire axillary lymph nodes are uh, divided into several groups by several classification. Like the axillary lymph nodes receive the major supply of the uh, lymphatic drainage, almost 75 to 80% while the internal memory nodes will be receiving only 5%, 5 to 10%. And both of them will be receiving uh, drainage in combination in 20%. Now, let the axillary lymph nodes are put into lateral group of lymph nodes that is along axillary vein. The anterior group of lymph nodes that is along lateral thoracic vessels, posterior group of lymph nodes that is along 
the subscapulary vessels and central that is in the axillary fat pad the apical group of leaf nodes which is also known as halsted uh, nodes or the infraclavicular leaf nodes are above the um, pectoralis minor tendon and we have inter interpectoral group of leaf nodes that is between pectoralis major and minor that is known as rotor's node now internal mammary nodes situated along these uh, internal mammary vessels adjacent to the sternum in the first three intercostal spaces about 2 to 3 cm lateral to the midline and 2 to 3 cm deep and uh, most of these uh, uh, leaf nodes that drain into this internal mammary nodes are from the posterior third of the breast and mainly in the medial quadrant of the breast so because of this uh, several uh, nomenclature the box classified these leaf nodes into three levels that is known as box level of classification based on the based uh, based on the relation to the pectoralis minor muscle so the he classified all those uh, leaf nodes into three groups that is level 1 2 and 3 level 1 are the group of leaf nodes that are lateral to this pectoralis minor muscle and these uh, group will include anterior posterior and lateral groups that we discussed in this previous slide so out of all these the the lateral anterior and posterior will belong to level 1 group of leaf nodes now level 2 leaf nodes are the one which are posterior to pectoralis minor muscle and that includes central and rotor's group of leaf nodes rotor's is basically interpectoral that is between the pectoralis major and pectoralis minor muscle level 3 group of leaf nodes just one second i'll allow participants to join okay so level 3 nodes uh, medial to the pectoralis minor muscle that is also known as infraclavicular apical or halsted group of leaf nodes so this is bugs classification of axillary leaf nodes so questions may be framed level 1 leaf nodes includes all of the following except so we have to be clear in this particular area so this these are the leaf nodes that we discussed just now level 1 lateral to the pectoralis minor level 2 posterior to the pectoralis minor and level 3 medial to the pectoralis minor muscle now comes another important understanding of the nerve supply in the breast cancer so uh, lung there are three important nerves that we that we encounter while doing breast surgery so the first important nerve is this this nerve which is known as lung thoracic nerve it basically supplies the supplies the serrator's anterior muscle and if damaged it will cause winging of the scapula second important nerve is the thoracodorsal nerve which supplies the latissimus dorsi muscle third important nerve is the intercostal brachial nerve which supplies the medial aspect of this uh, this mid upper arm and that is why when we injure this nerve during surgery it will come uh, it is invariably injured we have to dissect it because we need to enter the axilla and remove the leaf nodes the so the frequent complaint of the patients in, in the post op period is the numbness in the upper arm in the medial aspect the same picture give uh, the uh, now in the in context of sur surgery has been shown so we can see this is the lung thoracic nerve this is the thoracodorsal nerve lung thoracic nerve supplying the serratus anterior muscle and uh, thoracodorsal nerve supplying the latissimus dorsi muscle and this is the intercostal brachial nerve is going into into the uh, to supply the medial aspect of the uh, upper arm so uh, here uh, the uh, intercostal brachial nerve has been preserved but uh, if if we are able to preserve it we should preserve it now uh, level 1 group of lymphoids are basically uh, lateral to the 
pectoralis minor muscle while level 3 are the medial to the pectoralis minor muscle and level 2 is uh, behind the pectoralis minor behind the pectoralis minor muscle so triple assessment uh, we have been uh, listening this uh, triple assessment uh, since our mbbs days and this basically comprise of a clinical imaging uh, clinical examination imaging and pathology and the clinical uh, includes age and examination imaging we have ultrasonography and mammography and in pathology we have corporate biopsy and appendicitis so when combine all of these the positive predictive value is more than 99.9% there is another term called triple score so that triple score is when we are able to concurrently say that this is a benign concurrent and concurrently say that it is malignant then that is known as triple score that is also based on all these parameters what they do basically in clinical it is uh, if they say malignant in imaging if uh, they say it is malignant and in pathology also it is malignant then that is known as concurrently malignant similarly uh, if on clinical it is like benign on imaging also it is benign and on pathology also it is benign so that becomes concurrently uh, benign so that is how new things has come up now uh, we'll test ourselves with uh, this uh, mcq but uh, before uh, we practice this mcq i would like to give you tips that we need to read all the options before we go and tick on any of the options given don't uh, take any of the questions uh, too light because every correct answer is fetching you a mark and uh, if wrong you will be uh, rank much more below so uh, you can use the chat box and reply me what is the best promote synthesis a is augmentation mammoplasty b reduction mammoplasty c breast conserving surgery and d 3d mammography Yes, it is D. Now, uh, this is uh, recent advances that, uh, in the especially in the radiology, the breast tumor synthesis. We'll be discussing about this shortly. So, what is mammography? Mammography is basically low voltage, high amperage system of X-ray. So, they will they will take the X-ray and the radiation dose is very low that is 0.1 centigrade per view. So there are basically four views and that is why the total radiation dose will be 0.4 centigrade. But per X-ray, it is 0.1 centigrade. The sensitivity of mammography will increase uh, with age because of the fatty breast. And however, 5% are missed uh, by population-based mammographic screening. This is a data from Bailey, so I have highlighted it. Now basically there are two views craniocaudal and medio oblique view but uh, medio lateral oblique view but there are several other views that we will be discussing so tomosynthesis is, is basically what they do they will take the x-ray in multiple from multiple angles in the in the arc like way in the arc form they will be taking from different side uh, different uh, x-rays from the different side and based on that, they will reconstruct the image and that will help us to know whether the minor changes that will be seen on mammography is truly a major changes that will be identified in tomosynthesis. So it has significantly higher detection rate of the breast cancer and it will excel in delineating the small and multiple masses. Like we see, this is the conventional mammography and here the mass, this is the mass, but it is not so evident. But uh, when we performed a uh, breast trauma synthesis, then we can see that there is some speculations and uh, there is architectural distortion also. And that is, uh, that is making us realize that this must be some malignant in nature. So the lesion, so the lesion which is vaguely apparent on conventional mammography is better visualized on tomosynthesis. And that is why uh, the tomosynthesis is recently 
much discussed of. Now I will uh, I will uh, highlight how to read the mammography, how mammography is taken because now the questions are asked in very clinical scenario. They give the clinical scenario, they give the clinical images, and they will ask uh, the they will formulate the options accordingly. So we need to understand each and every aspect of breast tumor synthesis and uh, mammography. So why the first thing that I want to highlight is why we do bilateral mammography in, a, in spite of a single uh, breast cancer. Like we have breast cancer in the right side, even then we will ask for bilateral mammography. The reason is to identify the non-palpable lesions on the contralateral breast and to rule out the bilateral synchronous cancer, which is present in case of 2 to 3 percent, and also to establish the no normalcy of the contralateral breast. So the following, cat uh, following point should be reported uh, while giving the mammography report. That is the cate uh, category of the breast density, the mass description, shape, margin, density, and calcification. So uh, we'll discuss uh, each of them one by one. So this is how they take a mediolateral oblique view and craniocaudal view. So uh, we can we can we can realize the sense of uh, compression they give to the breast while doing the mammography, and because of that, the tender breast and the pregnant lactating mother cannot be recommended mammography at that phase of uh, at that during that time. The com this compression is uh, a necessity because it helps to separate the breast tissue and avoid the motion artifact artifacts to identify even a small lesion. And because of this, uh, we recommend uh, mammography after few days of menstrual cycle in the proliferative phase because compression in the secretive phase becomes much more painful. So they do, they do ask in uh, in our practical examination that during which phase of menstrual cycle should we be doing the mammography and the answer is definitely during the uh, proliferative phase that is the uh, after uh, five to after uh, seven to uh, 14 days so this is the medial lateral oblique view and this is the cranial product view This, uh, multi, uh, in breast cancer, we have multicentricity and multifocality. The, the, the definition of multicentry is the presence of second breast cancer outside the primary breast quadrant, or it is more than four centimeter away. So we should know that particular uh, number, four centimeter away, or it should be in the different quadrant. Then that is known as multicentricity. While if it is within the same quadrant, or within four centimeter distance, then that is known as multifocality. So these are the two views that we uh, do, uh, we were talking: the medial lateral oblique view and the craniocaudal view. We have much more views uh, that is cleavage view, Cleopatra view, lateral view, magnification view. We'll be discussing that also. Now before we uh, we go into the depth of this mammography, first we need to know adequate, what is the adequate ma ma mammography. So the adequate mammography is when we have the nipple areola complex in the profile, the pectoralis major muscle is up to the level of nipple such that the angle between this apex and the nipple areola complex is 90 degree. We must be able to see the inframammary fold to call it adequate mammography and there should be no any skin fold and, and there should be the axillary view as well. So that will represent the adequate mammography. Similarly, in case of craniocaudal view also, we need to see the pectoralis major muscle. It should be in the profile, especially the middle third. The medial fold, this is basically the medial fold. So, so one thing I would like to highlight here that in mammography, in the craniocaudal view, the one which is below, the one which is uh, where there is this, this marker is the lateral aspect. Okay, so this is the outer aspect. So once the lump is in this area, so it will be known as outer, uh, the lump in the outer region. 
while when it is in this uh, fold below that that is the lump here is known as uh, the lump is present in inner quadrant okay so like in this picture so if uh, this will represent outer quadrant this is will represent inner quadrant and this is out, uh, upper and this is lower upper and lower is is given in the case of medial lateral oblique view and outer and inner is decided in case of craniofacial view so uh, breast is breast breast is uh, breast parenchyma density is basically categorized according to acr acr into four categories a b c d so these these are complex thing to remember but uh, the easy way is d is for dense so so acr category d represents uh, dense breast while acr category a represents fatty breast so that is elderly d is for dense for young uh, young women now the in between is the b and c so once the we have this uh, acr grading when uh, the glandular component is less than 25% so it is grade a while uh, if the glandular component is more than 75% that that is grade d extremely dense breast so in mammography we can the, the mass shape this is about shape the mass shape can be round like this it can be oval it can be lobulated and it can be irregular the mass margin can be as in this picture it can be sharply defined it can be obscured like this it is not clearly defined or indistinct like this and is populated like in this picture similarly the mass density which is compared according to the surrounding breast parenchyma we can see that this is a very dense mass while this is iso dense mass similar to the surrounding breast parenchyma and this is low dense mass uh, when compared to the surrounding parenchyma now we all talk of microcalcification in the mammography so what basically microcalcification means microcalcification is the one whose diameter is less than 0.5 mm and when we have more than 5 microcalcification in the area of 1 cm square that will be known as clustered microcalcification so these are basically benign microcalcification so the the mcq that is uh, is old mcq popcorn calcification is seen in fibroadenoma so this is the popcorn calcification as we see in this figure c so these are various uh, microcalcification uh, these are of intermediate concern while these are of high probability of malignancy that is pleomorphic calcification the term pleomorphic means it is variable in density size and shape so we can see none of the microcalcifications are similar they are of variable density shape and size so these pleomorphic calcifications which are usually associated with malignancy uh, are of our high concern so uh, the the descriptions of this calcifications as i said in the previous uh, slide that it is known as clustered when we have more than five calcification in 1 cm square of area similarly uh, uh, it is ductal when it is localized to particular ducts uh, duct and segmental when it is uh, localized to one segment of the breast and diffuse when it is more than one segment of the breast so we have uh, two views as the standard views that is medial lateral oblique view and craniofacial view while the supplementary views are lateral extended craniofacial magnification compression cleavage so this is the pictorial representation of uh, all those views that are taken now biopsies we all discussed biopsy uh, uh, mammography and based on those mammography finding the there is a reporting system known as biopsies that is breast imaging reporting and data system now this uh, rats classifications have come up in uh, several organs like we know uh, tyroids when it is done for thyroid biopsies when it is done for uh, for prostate and similarly lung rats is also there and core rats is when uh, there was pandemic of covid 
Now, the Bayard's classification is basically from zero to six. Zero is incomplete uh, when uh, the assessment is not proper and we need to repeat the uh, mammography. One is negative and in that case, we can be assured that the, 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 the risk of malignancy is less than 1%. So we recommend a routine annual screening. Two is benign, three is probably benign, four is further subdivided into four A, B, C, depending on their risk of malignancy. So four A is uh, low suspicious for malignancy, four B is moderate suspicion for malignancy, four C is when we have very high suspicion for malignancy, and the risk of malignancy is 50 to 95 percent. So for A onwards, there is the role of biopsy. We need to do biopsy. And six is definitely biopsy proven malignancy. And appropriate treatment should be started for that. One, uh, one thing here I would like to say that in tyrants, all of these classifications are similar. Only zero is not there in tyrants. Okay. Otherwise, the tyrants con contains uh, all these consist of one, two, three, four A, four B, four C, five, six. Similarly, similar description is there negative, benign, probably benign. So with this one classification, you can remember two classifications. Now, when should we screen uh, patient uh, in case of breast? So these are uh, these are there are two basically society that recommends a screening in case of breast uh, cancer screening. We have this uh, American Cancer Society and another U.S. Preventive Service Task Force. And according to that, uh, the, the American Cancer Society recommend uh, uh, screening from the 40 years of age for average risk women, okay? While the US Preventive Service Task Force is not so keen on screening and they will recommend screening only after 50 years of age and that to biennially, that is every two years. While the American Cancer Society recommends, uh, is very keen on screening and recommends screening right from the 40 years of age and that too annually. Now uh, we have another important concept of uh, screening in high risk uh, patient. Now what is high risk? When the risk of malignancy in women is more than 20% that is known as high risk. While when it is uh, between uh, 50 to 20% that is moderate risk and when it is less than 50% that is known as low risk. So the ACS recommendation says that when the risk is more than 20%, we should do MRI, but together with mammography. The reason why mammography is added together with MRI is because the sensitivity of MRI is high, but the specificity is low. And that is the reason why they will detect, uh, there is high chance of false positivity they will detect even a small uh, a small uh, lesion and uh, will uh, and there, is, there is chance of high positivity high false positivity so a mammography and uh, this uh, mri should be used in combination and the screening uh, in case of high risk is a little earlier than the usual uh, patient like as i said uh, the usual screening is from the 40 years but when there is a BRCA mutation in women then the or because BRCA mutation is a high risk uh, mutation and the patient will come, fall under the categories of high risk. So there the rescreening starts from the 30 years of age. At this point of time, I'd also like to highlight when there is BRCA in men, the screening age becomes 35 years. And when there is a mantle cell irradiation, a history of uh, mantle cell irradiation, in that case, the screening age is 25 years. So you, you should remember all the screening is because this is a one-liner question. That is uh, 30 for women, 35 for men, and 25 for mental cell irradiation. So this is uh, the table given in our uh, Sabiston. And here uh, he has beautifully uh, classified into three groups. That is high risk, moderate risk, and low risk. So high risk is the one uh, with uh, uh, risk of more than 20% and moderate between 15 to 20% and low when it is less than 15%. So uh, the high risk uh, following are the patients who are high risk, that is BRCA mutations, the relatives of BRCA mutations, 
Lee-Fraumeni syndrome, Cowden syndrome, the relatives of uh, Lee-Fraumeni and Cowden syndrome, the history of radiation exposure uh, at the at the early age, like ten between ten and thirty. So those are high risk, and the moderate risk are tabulated here. Now one important point that we need not do MRI when the risk is less than fifteen percent, and uh, we should always combine mammography with uh, MRI whenever possible. If uh, like uh, mammography can be done every six months or it can be done annually together with MRI. And uh, ideally the breast MRI should be performed uh, between seven to 15 days of the menstrual cycle, just like a mammography. So, when you find it hard to concentrate, uh, there is one technique uh, which uh, which uh, we use that is the Pomodoro, Pomodoro technique. So this uh, this basically is a technique which is very famous and you can have you have an app for that with this logo. You can just Google Play and search this Focus to Do app is there. How does this app help when you find it difficult to concentrate? at this uh, age of time when uh, the social media and there are several online platforms. So you can just pick up a task and then set a timer for, uh, they, they have flexible timer. That is you can, the baseline timer is 25 minutes and you can increase it as the day, as the time passes. And then you need not distract yourself during that 25 minutes. The timer will start and you have to work during that time. You have read it thoroughly. And you can then increase your stamina based on, like you will begin with 25 minutes and then we will increase it to 30 minutes, one hour, two hour, three hour. And this is, will how help you establish your concentration. During our session, I shall be teaching you these tips and tricks and techniques of studying effectively and smartly. So, Gold standard investigation for screening of breast cancer in patients with uh, breast implant. So let's test ourselves with this MCQ. Mammography, MRI, USG, and CT scan. You can just reply me in the chat box. MRI. Yes, uh, this is MRI. What is the sign that is that is seen in the MRI? We'll be discussing shortly. So uh, before moving on to MRI, let let us discuss uh, the imaging modalities that are used in uh, breast cancer evaluation. That is ultrasonography. So ultrasonography is basically indi indicated in case of young women with a dense breast, especially in the uh, in the women who are less than 35 years of the age. The greatest advantage of MRI is that it will help to correct, sorry, uh, ultrasonography is that it will help to characterize the lesion, okay? Whether it is solid or there are cystic component, okay? Whether it is malignant looking. Second important in advantage is to localize the impalpable areas of the breast, okay? Third important is we can do the uh, ultrasonography of the axilla at that point of time and we can identify the malignant appearing nodes. And of course, the third very, very important uh, role of ultrasonography is the interventional guidance. That is, we can place the marker okay, in the breast parent time when we are planning for new adjuvant chemotherapy or we can do the biopsy, ultrasonography guided biopsy of both the axilla or uh, uh, axillary lymph nodes or the breast uh, cancer tumor. So these are the indications of breast sonography, like young death breast when the woman is pregnant or lactating, when the breast, like in the male breast cancer, when there are nipple discharge. So uh, all these will, uh, will be indications for uh, breast sonography. So ultrasonography actually does not replace mammography, but uh, and it is also not a screening tool, but it is 
recommended along with the along with the uh, mammography in case of dense breast, young breast, and high risk women. So in the axilla, it will help to know the malignant appearing nodes. So what are the five characteristics of malignant nodes? So these uh, they are round, they are hypoechoic, there is loss of fatty hyla, there is cortical thickening, the, the size is more than one centimeter, there is a subcortical effacement, there is extracapsular spread, all those features can be seen in the node and, and that will help us to characterize the axillary lymph nodes. Also, in case of nipple discharge, uh, so, so the worrisome discharge, that is the pathological discharge are the one which are characterized by four S. That is single side, single duct, spontaneous, and it should be serosanguineous. So those are the pathological uh, nipple discharge. And these are the causes of nipple discharge, uh, that is carcinoma, duct papilloma, duct ectasia. We have uh, benign breast disease as a separate chapter in this presentation. So male breast uh, on sonography, we can see uh, the uh, finding pertaining to the breast tumor. So interventional guidance, this is the node, uh, this is the uh, trucker biopsy. So we know, uh, we need to know how we do this uh, image guided for biopsy because we'll be taking the most representative area from the uh, tumor and we should not um, have some geographical miss and that is why we use USC guided or any uh, imaging guided biopsy. So what is the length of this uh, core that we get from the core biopsy? Can anybody tell? The length of core that we get for core biopsy. We all know that the, the, the gauze of a core biopsy needle is 14 to 16 gauze, okay. And FNSC is 20 to 23, uh, 23 gauge. But what is the length of the core biopsy that we get from this core biopsy needle? So for the benefit of uh, all of you, the length of core biopsy is 19 mm, 19 mm, almost two centimeters. So imaging uh, MRI. MRI is basically a problem solving tool in, the, in case of uh, breast ca cancer imaging. It will help us to differentiate a scar from the recurrence post BCS because, uh, because uh, it, will, uh, it will help us to differentiate the scar from the tumor recurrence because of the characteristics of the MRI well, the tumor will be hyper enhancing. Now, this has low sensitivity within the nine months of radiation therapy. It will also, uh, it is also used in case of prior history of implant. And when we have uh, MEO of axilla, that is the metastasis of unknown origin of axilla, that is also known as occult breast cancer. Occult breast cancer basically means there is no lump in the breast, but there are axillary leaf endopathy. So that is known as uh, occult breast cancer. Pages, uh, when we have Paget's disease without uh, mammography or ultrasonography identified mass, and when we are planning uh, BCS, in that case, we have to, that BCS means wide local excision, then we need to do MRI. And uh, implants will be the best imaging modality. And screening in high risk women, as we discussed, when the lifetime risk is more than 20 to 25%. So, uh, same thing. That is evaluating the suspicious mammographic finding. Malignancy uh, will to know that extent the monitoring of response to new adjuvant chemotherapy, which will help to differentiate the scar from recurrence, and also to search for breast, breast parenchyma, breast parenchyma like in occult breast cancer. So high risk women, we discussed who are the high risk uh, women who need to be screened. That is the BRCA one patient and the BRCA1, uh, the relatives of BRCA1 patient. Similarly, leaf from many or cordens patient and the relative of leaf from many and cordens patient. And when we have the history of radiation in, uh, in our early childhood. So uh, this is the breast mold where uh, the, which is used to acquire the breast MRI. So here uh, the woman is uh, laid supine and the breast will fall into this cavity and this is the chin rest and the imaging will be taken. And 
uh, we'll after uh, acquiring the imaging, we'll get the image like this. And uh, here, uh, the tumor is in this uh, right side. So normally, when we have supine patient uh, on CT scan or or in uh, on uh, on CT scan or on uh, X-ray, this side is the is the left side. But uh, here, this is the right side because the patient is supine. So you can imagine yourself. This is the lump in the right side. So you can get a clinical image like this and MCQ can be framed the lump in right side or lump in left side. So this is lump in right side. Okay, and the, the characteristic of malignant appearing lesion on MRI is speculation, irregularity, rim enhancement and heterogeneity. So as you see, the, there is a rim enhancement the, and with the the surrounding rim of the lump is enhanced than the, than the central area. So that is, a tip, and there is speculation also. So this is the malignant node, sorry, malignant lump uh, in the right breast. The same picture when it is, uh, when it is rotated, so this is now right and this is now left. So you should have good orientation of right and left. Now, uh, there is one score, which is uh, known as Fisher score. This will, uh, is used in case of breast MRI and the score of six to eight is highly suggestive for malignancy based on all those criteria that are, uh, that are the morphology of the uh, malignancy like rib enhancement, signal intensity is very high, there is washout in the curve. So uh, when we are doing MRI in case of breast implant, then we'll be getting a sign known as lingvin sign, which is the most reliable sign to help us know that there is intracapsular rupture or extracapsular rupture. Let's test ourselves with, with this MCQ. Which of the following is true statement regarding FNAC biopsy in breast cancer? True statement. Yes, C is the true statement. We already discussed that, but let us discuss the other option as well. So we must, uh, even though this, uh, we must uh, see and read each and each option one by one. Otherwise, we may miss the right answer. So, and one another rule is that. Always is always wrong and never is never right. So whenever there is uh, option that uh, that includes always, never, must. So they are usually usually not the right answer. You have to usually that is usually. And similarly, may or may not be or might or might not be usually the correct answer. But uh, of course, uh, that is not the replacement for good and thorough knowledge. But that is uh, somehow which may help in the difficult situation. So option A, FNSC uses uh, a 16 gauze needle in the wrong answer because FNSC uh, uses 20 to 23 gauze. Similarly, core needle biopsy uses 14 to 16 gauze. So triple assessment has a positive predictive value of 99.9% correct and FNSC, of course, core biopsy we need to see uh, to differentiate between DCIS and IDC because the basement membrane need to be evaluated to know it whether it is invasive ductal cancer or it is a ductal carcinoma in situ. When the basement membrane is not involved, then that is DCIS. While when it is involved, then that then that is known as invasive ductal cancer. So a biopsy, uh, the the biopsy has a different uh, core needle biopsy or trucot biopsy has a different histological uh, establishes the different histological diagnosis by and help us to differentiate it versus invasive and it will also help us to know the hormonal receptors isc marker erpr hot to new which will help to guide the new management chemotherapy this will be this the the entire systemic therapy will be discussed today uh, uh, in the systemic chapter.
So size uh, 8 to 14 gauss of the needle is used. The false negativity rate is very less, that is less than 1%. Large needle biopsy with vacuum, that is also known as vacuum assisted biopsy, is the centric coming up in, uh, in the breast cancer, especially in micro calcification. So, and this, this, this line is mentioned in Bailey, so it is one of the important chapters, uh, important, uh, important points like where is the role of vacuum assisted biopsy? So, it is micro calcification. Indication of surgical biopsy after four needle biopsy. That many a time we'll come across a situation where we'll have uh, we'll have uh, some a report of no clear cut report like invasive ductal cancer. Rather, we'll be having this uh, kind of uh, a typical ductal hyperplasia. Okay, pleomorphic LCIS. Okay, there will be situation when there will be discordance between the imaging finding and the histological finding. Imaging will be saying it will be bad. 5, barrett 4C, but on histopathology, it will be a typical ductal mid, uh, uh, hyperplasia or interductal papilloma. So those are the situation where we have to do this surgical biopsy. What surgical biopsy means wide local excision. So these are the situation uh, we have to do uh, uh, surgical biopsy after core needle biopsy, excisional biopsy, role of excisional biopsy in case of breast cancer. So this is the vacuum assisted biopsy you can see and this is the needle basically they will be using uh, a vacuum pressure so that they can retrieve maximum micro calcification and, and and the patient can be reliably told that his, uh, the disease has been removed and uh, we need to do this when the tumor is very small when there is big mass okay the complex cystic mass is there when there is a high risk lesion like adh lcis so ALH, radialis scar, papilloma, all these are indications despite microcalcifications. Now FNSC, we discussed uh, core biopsy. Now FNSC slightly, we'll be discussing about FNSC. Is there a role of FNSC in this current era? Yes, there is role when especially limited role, especially when we need to evaluate the axillary lymph node to know whether it is just a malignant or, or a benign. And to confirm the recurrence, like when we have a recurrent disease, so we can just simply do FNSC rather than core biopsy. And also, we have, if we have multifocal breast cancer, the greatest disadvantage of uh, FNSC is that we cannot differentiate between in situ versus invasive cancer, and it has high FNR. The FNR of that is false negativity rate. The FNR of core biopsy is less than one percent, but the false negativity rate of FNSC is more than twenty percent. And if FNA detect malignancy, a core, needle, a core needle biopsy is anyway going to be contemplated. So why not do core needle biopsy first? Okay. Now we'll be discussing very, very important concept of uh, this uh, pathological evaluation of the breast cancer because uh, now the, re the reporting system has changed. Now we will get report like this. You, this is our original report and if you see the report will be like this so we must understand everything like they will be saying uh, section shows uh, invasive cancer of no special type that is ductal grade 2 3 plus 2 plus 1 is equal to 6 okay so now what is this 3 plus 2 plus 1 is equal to 6 and what is grade 2 okay similarly in IHC marker we will be getting report like this uh, the percentage score is uh, <clears throat> three intensity score is two total score is five so what does that mean we need to understand before we before we uh, before we understand the result of the report we need to have the concept so that we can understand the report now they are not saying that it is hormone receptor positive one are the days now they will give the number so you have to know the intensity of positivity okay so to understand that report, which I showed you previously, we have to understand this uh, uh, Nottingham grading, which is the modification of uh, the original scarp bloom richardson grading. So basically they will, so basically they will, uh, they will, um, the biopsy specimen will be graded on these three parameters. That is tubule formation, okay nuclear pleomorphism and mitotic count. In the tubule formation, they will see how the breast tubule, how good it is, um, how, 
how differentiated it is. So if there are majority of the tumor contains tubule, means it is well differentiated. So it will be, uh, they will give one point, okay. It means that is lower grade. And this is moderately, moderate degree. That is, there is only 10 to 75% tubules are there. So two points will be given. Little, there are no tubules. That is not good differentiation. So they will give three points. Nuclear pleomorphism, how variable the nuclear characteristics is. If it is uniform, that is well differentiated, small, regular, uniform cells are there, they will give one point. When there is marked variation, they will give three point. When there is moderate differentiation, they will give two point. Similarly, mitotic count, when the mitotic count is less, that they will give one point. When it is moderate, two point. When it is high, they will give three point. So the total score is basically three plus three plus three is nine. Okay, and the minimum score is, the total highest score is three, the minimum score is one plus one plus one is three. So its minimum score is three and the maximum score is nine. Now, based on uh, the total score, they will grade it. So this is very important because this is the favorite of the teachers and they will, they will not give you uh, the uh, poor grade or moderate grade. You need to formulate or uh, you need to interpret on your own. So when the grade is between six to seven, the total score is between six to seven, that is grade two. Now how to remember this? I usually remember the, uh, the, the grade two because anything less than that will be grade one and anything above that is the grade three, okay. So, so grade six to seven is grade, uh, total score six to seven is grade two. Now we can, uh, I usually tend to forget these numbers. So how do I remember? So if you count the, the, the alphabet in breast, it is six, B-R-E-A-S-T, okay. So that breast six letter word, six to seven is grade two. Okay, and anything less than that is grade one and more than that is grade three. Okay, now I think uh, after this, uh, we are in a better position to know, uh, understand this report. So here what they are saying, section shows features of invasive cancer of no special type, ductal, fine, grade two, because three plus two plus one was basically TNM, that is tubule formation, uh, nuclear pleomorphism, and M is for mitotic count. Okay, that is total is equal to six. So that is, that is why he has given the report of grade two. So this can be remem remembered is T and M. Okay. Now we'll understand the hormone receptor marker, how they are grading it and, and how we'll understand it and we'll remember it also. I'll, I'll tell the trick also. Okay. So the hormone receptor is uh, given by the already score. The grade is given by the Nottingham score. So this is basically Nottingham score which is the modification of uh, bloom richardson score. So Nottingham grading system was modified recently because this bloom richardson system is a, uh, original one, was the original one and they, they gave in 1957, but AJCC uh, uh, modified and used it as a Nottingham grading system. Now already a score, what they do, the cells will be stained and, when, and they will see the number of cells that are stained and the intensity of the staining. So PS is the proportion score, and uh, that is the number of cells that are stained. So this is the percent. If if uh, 66 to 100 percent of the cells are stained, so that uh, proportion score is five. So proportion score is between zero to five, and the intensity score is between zero to three. When we have more proportion of cell, we have the highest uh, proportion score of five. When we have a uh, strong intensity, then that is the highest intensity is three. So here, the, the, the minimum total score is zero plus zero is zero. And the highest total score is five plus three is eight. So the minimum score is zero and highest score is eight. So zero to two is known as negative. So it is negative and three to eight is known as positive. Okay, so when the number is, uh, we'll read uh, between three to eight, we'll understand that the hormone receptor is positive. When the number will read between uh, zero to two, we'll understand the hormone receptor is negative. Now, now this uh, uh, less than 1% of the cell is known as 
uh, hormone receptor negative, while as you can see, and uh, more than 10% is positive. Between one to 10% is low positive. Now we'll read the same report again. So here, this is the already score that they have used. An estrogen receptor, okay, the proportion score is three, fine, it's, uh, and the intensity score is two. So three plus two is five, it is positive. Estrogen receptor is positive. Progesterone receptor, uh, we have the percentage score of five, intensity score of two, and that is seven. So this is also positive. So the already score says that their hormone receptor is positive in this particular biopsy specimen. Fine. Hope everyone is clear. Now we have how to receptor. This is another important marker uh, in case of IC marker in case of evaluation of breast cancer. We we must have studied in our MS during our MS days only that um, the when it is one plus that is known as negative zero or one plus it is known as negative. 2 plus is equivocal and 3 plus is positive. So for this equivocal, we'll be doing fees. Now there are two types of fees. That is uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization, single uh, single pro fees and dual pro fees. The single pro fees will be using only the copy number. How many copy of cells are like that? Okay. So when the copy number is more than six, and uh, that is and and when how to by CEP ratio is more than two, so that is positive. So ISC positive is when we have a fees positive is when the copy number and the ratio that is C how to by safe ratio is more than two. So so the magic number is more than two uh, for ratio and for copy number it is more than four. So with this background of knowledge, now we'll try this MCQ, which of the following statements about luminal A subtype is true. So you may try this question. Luminal A types, we'll be discussing the molecular types of breast cancer shortly. So, yes, the correct answer is C. It is characterized by high expression of uh, levels of ER related genes and low expression of the HOT2 cluster and proliferation associated genes. Now, the breast cancer has been uh, broadly classified into four molecular subtypes that is luminal A, luminal B, or to uh, enriched and basal cell like. Luminal A is the most common one. It has basically ERPR positive and the KI67 is less than 14%. Luminal B is uh, ERPR uh, positive, okay, or to negative, and the KI67 is more than 40%. How to enrich these, how to positive, rest of the markers are negative. And basal cell like, which is also known as triple negative, all of the markers are negative. Okay, so luminal A is the most common type and, and it is about 74%. Um, and <coughs> the tumors who ha has molecular subtype A are most favorable, has most favorable prognosis. While the luminal B has a higher grade and more aggressive than the luminal A because of the high KI67. KI67 is basically proliferative index. So after you answer what is the uh, what is KI67, uh, you will tell it is proliferative index. They will ask what are the other proliferative markers. So we have yes self uh, yes phase fraction and MIB1 uh, expression, which are the other proliferative markers that are used in breast cancer. Or to uh, so uh, now the basal like triple negative about 70. One thing I would like to tell that basal like is not similar to triple negative, okay. But at your level, you should take it as uh, similar. But actually, the basal like 
is again further divided into four categories. Okay, triple negative, mesenchymal like, all those things are there. But uh, for your level, you can just think that uh, it is similar to triple negative. Because uh, because seventy percent more than seventy percent uh, under basal like is triple negative, so we can think that way. Because uh, after uh, subclassification of this basal like, there are in fact there are six other uh, subclassification of basal like like uh, it is mesenchymal like, mesenchymal stem cell like, immunomodulatory, luminal, androgen receptor, all those are there. So that may create confusion so i did not put up all the slides and uh, one important point i would like to highlight here is that in ca breast the cutoff is 14 percent that is uh, that is uh, very commonly asked but now they have started asking the cutoff in a uh, neuroendocrine tumor so the cutoff of ki 67 in neuroendocrine tumor is is can anybody answer is is 20%, okay. So this is uh, <coughs> this is the table that will highlight uh, the, the features of these uh, several luminal types. <clears throat> so luminal A, as I discussed, it is the most common one and it has a very good prognosis and the prognosis decreases, uh, decreases like the, the basal like has the worst prognosis and the luminal A has the best prognosis. The histological correlation usually it is uh, positive, okay. Uh, armor receptor positive. Triple, uh, treatment, the endocrine treatment has a good role in luminal A and luminal B. While in HER2 positive, uh, we have to use trastuzumab, okay, targeted therapy. And in basal like, we cannot use either endocrine therapy or anti HER2 therapy. And the response to chemotherapy, the basal like has good response to platinum drugs, while the HER2 receptor has good response uh, to the anthracycline drugs. Now let's test ourselves with this MCQ. All of the following statement is true regarding lobular carcinoma breast. So, Option A, lobular carcinoma in situ associated with 20% progression to invasive cancer. Option B, E. cadherin expression used in IC to identify them. Which is the wrong statement? Multifocality and bi bilaterality common. So MRI is used. Which is the false statement? So, is the, the we are asking false statement, not true statement. That is true. B, B is true. Yes, yes. Uh, answer is A because uh, premorphic has bad, bad prognosis compared to the classic lobular type. This is wrong, A is the right answer. So again, I, I would like to talk something about a Pomodoro trade technique. How should we study effectively? We should divide your day of study, like uh, some students are able to study for nine hours, some for six hours, for, some for 12 hours. So you need to divide your day of study, total time of study. Like uh, I suggest uh, nine hours is the maximum time that a human can actually concentrate upon. And you should uh, divide it again into three uh, hours per setting. Like ninth hour is the total duration of study that you can do. So you divide it three sitting, uh, three hours per sitting. Okay, three sitting. Because you have to have uh, aim uh, or a target to achieve. Without aim, you can't excel. Make a target and make your effort to achieve it. It is, uh, it is, uh, it is not about studying everything in one day. It is the consistency that we can give to our uh, study that will help you achieve the success. So we'll be now discussing in great detail the carcinoma breast right from the risk factor and everything uh, till the treatment. 
So you uh, would you like to take a break and then soon we start break up five minute. We'll have break of five minutes and then we'll resume shortly. So we'll resume now. So the incidence of breast cancer. In our day-to-day -day practice, when we sit in our OPD, the most of the cancer that present to us are the sporadic breast cancer. 
the incidence of hereditary breast cancer is very common, very less common. That is only five to ten percent, and out of which the BRCA mutation is the one which are much more common. So BRCA one uh, is the most common out of the, all the hereditary breast cancer, and we have other uh, other important genetic uh, syndrome that are that has high penetrance. Now the difference between high penetrance and the low penetrance are, is that the high penetrance will tend to present or manifest uh, during their lifetime. There is high chance of manifestation during the lifetime. So it is not that if you have many uh, mutations, you will be manifesting all of them. So that is why there comes the role of high uh, penetration or the actionable mutation. We call it as an actionable mutation. We need to tailor our treatment depending on the uh, mutations that are present. There are several non-actionable uh, mutations or low penetrance, penetrance mutations and uh, that, uh, that is usually not taken care of or they are the future or uh, research questions. So, so that is why the things that are uh, given in our textbook are usually the one which has high penetrance. So, for example, BRCA1, BRCA2, leave from any powder and jagger, all, all of these are high penetrance gene. So you, you must remember these, uh, these disorders. So which are the following statement is true regarding uh, the risk factor of breast cancer. Risk uh, factor of breast cancer is important topic because they can have several permutation and combination and they frame question which seemingly is easier but they can trap you by changing the option. So here, uh, the, the correct answer is, is option A, that is breast cancer risk appears about 10 uh, years after radiation for Hodgkin's disease. The obesity in premenopausal women is not associated with increased risk. In fact, the postmenopausal women with obesity is the increased risk factor. Okay, 2% 2 uh, 2 incidence of breast cancer is there in male and a diet low in phytoestrogens is protective. So the, so the here the correct answer is A. Now risk factors may appear boring, but, uh, but I'll try to explain it in a lighter way so that it will be, uh, it will be easy to understand. Actually, the risk factor is divided into seven broad categories, like, uh, that is age, gender, personal history of breast cancer, histological risk factor, family history, reproductive and hormone use. So this is the table from Savistan. Now, the most important risk factor is female sex. The sex itself is a important risk factor. Sex itself is a important risk factor for uh, breast cancer in women. Uh, you, you, you may not believe, but uh, the, the, the incidence of uh, a breast cancer in women is about 20, uh, like it is about 100 times more than the male. So female 100 to 150 times. So the most important risk factor for development of breast cancer is gender. Now comes the age. But now though the age is not a strict parameter because uh, the very young women are now coming up with breast cancer. We can, we are seeing the uh, cancer even in women of 20 years of age. So it, it is not, there is, is no more uh, criteria like it used to be uh, that we used to say old age is the risk factor for breast cancer, but young women are coming with breast cancer because of several other uh, multifactorial reasons. And, and uh, but, uh, but uh, the median age of risk uh, of uh, breast cancer in women is 50 years, okay while in male it is uh, 60 years. So, so that is why the screening in uh, women is 30 years while screening in men, if he is at high risk is 35 years, five years later than the women. 
So the personal history is of course a breast cancer. Like if a patient has a um, milk, uh, like if a patient has a breast cancer on her right side, and he and she has received all the treatment, even then there is a risk of one percent every year, and that is the reason why we uh, call these patients for regular follow up so that we can de detect the contralateral breast cancer at an earlier stage, and we can have best, best treatment of that contralateral breast. Histological risk factor, uh, whenever there is RTPR during, uh, during, uh, during the biopsy, is, uh, biopsy report, we should be taking it with concern because the relative risk increases more than four times. Okay. And LCIS, that is lobular carcinoma in situ, is a risk factor rather than uh, uh, in situ cancer. And that is why <coughs> AJCC has removed the uh, LCIS from the TNM staging. And it is no more a uh, uh, TIS in breast cancer staging now. It is just a risk factor for a breast cancer. The mantle cell irradiation we usually talk of uh, as a risk factor because uh, the mantle cell radiation is, in fact, the radiation given to the uh, given to the upper chest, and that is for Hodgkin's disease. Okay, and when it is given in young age before 30 years, that will increase the risk of breast cancer and the relative risk is more than four times. So which of the following histological risk factor for breast cancer is also known as severe hyperplasia according to the DuPont and Page classification. Severe hyperplasia, which is known as severe hyperplasia. With atypia, without atypia, non-proliferative disease, LCIS. So, Yes, so I wanted to trap you and you are trapped, uh, Isthi. So, so the severe hyperplasia, according to DuPont and Page, is, is a proliferative disease, disease without atypia. And that this is the point given in Bailey. Uh, so, you may, no, sorry, in Savistan. So, you, you should know this. It, people may be easily carried away with at, at, atypia because it is severe, what is there. But severe hyperplasia is also known as proliferative disease without atypia, okay. So now uh, the familial risk factor, which I was discussing is uh, very important, though it is not co common, but it is important in context of exam, okay. The highest risk with a breast, uh, the highest risk of breast cancer is in, uh, if the patient is young, okay, and if there is bilateral breast cancer. So and if it is in first degree relative. So if the, all these are there, then the patient has highest risk. And the first degree relative, first degree relative, there is two to three times higher risk. And if it is premenopausal and bilateral and first degree, so all these will, uh, there will be cumulative addition. Okay. Now BRCA1, uh, we all know it is uh, autosomal uh, dominant. The chromosome associated is 17Q21. Why I have kept it? Because they will ask Q21. These days they are not asking 17. These days they are asking this previous one. Okay, in order to make our life very difficult. And it accounts for 40% of familial breast cancer. The lifetime risk of breast cancer is, is about 60 to 80%. Similarly, ovarian cancer is 30 to 50%. While in BRCA, the lifetime risk is less, 50 to 60% and ovarian cancer is 10 to 20 percent and what are other cancers that are associated we should know uh, this ovarian cancer male breast cancer prostate cancer in case of BRCA2 now uh, in BRCA one very very contrasting features that is there between BRCA1 and BRCA2 is that BRCA1 tend to have unfavorable histology that is the patient will have higher grade that is grade 3 as we discussed 8 or 9 and uh, total score and a hormone receptor negative triple negative breast cancer is usually associated with BRCA1 while BRCA2 though it is more common in male breast male breast it has hormone receptor positive positivity like the sporadic cancer so so the male breast cancer uh, has a better pro prognosis when compared to the female breast if they are of same stage but usually what happens the male will have advanced stage because of the less uh, par breast parenchyma and that is why uh, their prognosis uh, will decrease but uh, given the same stage uh, out of male and female the male has better prognosis because the receptor is positive 
so with this uh, background of knowledge we will be uh, discussing other uh, genetic risk factors that is leap from any syndrome autosomal dominant other tumor associated are sarcoma leukemia because we will be again discussing this leap from any when we will be discussing sarcoma cowden syndrome okay for uh, cancer of oral cavity ataxia telangiectasia and fusega these tumors are of high penetration so at least you should remember these names okay so the high penetration genes that i have highlighted in this box are the one which you should be thorough all all the names and the genes related to it so you may you know these low penetrance genes these are non actionable mutations now when should we ask for a genetic mutations in case of patient who present with breast cancer so when the patient have uh, have uh, have the breast cancer at a very young age like uh, whom do we call young in breast cancer it is 50 years or young uh, when the patient has breast cancer okay when the patient has triple negative breast cancer even though patient is 60 years that is indication of the genetic testing and rest of the indications are the family history okay male breast cancer askenazi jews okay all these things are taken to from this table is taken from uh, from uh, devita and here i i would like to uh, highlight that you should remember this uh, sporadic 50 years triple negative 60 years is still an indication for uh, genetic risk evaluation so similarly uh, reproductive risk factor we uh, all have been taught in our since our undergraduate days that the unopposed estrogen is the risk factor for breast cancer and, and the reason is that when the the the, the ovary are not uh, stopped or when there is no pregnancy then there will be continuous estrogen exposure especially when uh, the onset of menarche is before 12 years of age then what happen the uh, the ovulate uh, the cycle menstrual cycle are unavailable there is no progesterone and that is why the unopposed action of estrogen will increase the proliferation of the breast parenchyma and that is will increase the risk of breast cancer menopausal when the menopause is after the age of 55 years first life of uh, first life birth after 30 years it is said that when when the first uh, when you have a first full term pregnancy before ag is is 18 years then that is that will risk, uh, decrease the risk of breast cancer half than when you have first time uh, first uh, full term pregnancy after age 30 years okay that is uh, in relation to the risk Now, nulli parity is of course there is absence of uh, pregnancy, there is absence of breastfeeding, so that is why there is increased risk. Now, um, uh, let's be assured that uh, abortion, whether spontaneous or induced, does not increase breast risk uh, in any form. And uh, breastfeeding is protective; it will decrease the uh, breast risk because of lactation or menstruation. Okay. <laughs> now exogenous hormone this is a controversial topic uh, because uh, if you read many books many many confusion will be there uh, as oral contraceptive pills uh, some books says it increases risk some says it doesn't increase risk but as of now previously oral contraceptive pills were supposed to increase the risk but the recent oral contraceptive pills are coming with reduced content of uh, estrogen so now the risk is no increased risk is there with oral contraceptive pills hormone replacement therapy uh, is a risk for breast cancer this line is taken from sebiston so you read this line one by one uh, combination hormone replacement therapy with estrogen and progesterone for 5 years have approximately 20% increased risk for development of cancer okay hormone replacement therapy are given in post menopausal area uh, post menopausal women and that is associated with increased risk so that is why we ask in our history taking whether there is uh, use of post menopausal hormone replacement therapy now diet uh, diet risk factor uh, one important point here is that smoking is no uh, is not a risk factor for breast cancer breast of the Um, there are many cancers where we can read or you can mark as a guess smoking as a risk factor but smoking not a risk factor for breast cancer 
although high alcohol consumption is a risk similarly high fatty diet low uh, uh, vitamin c and obesity is of course a risk factor for breast cancer so what devita has done devita because we tend to forget the relative risk devita has classified into three broad categories that is the relative risk less than 2 relative risk between 2 to 4 and relative risk more than 4 so these are the highest one which uh, has um, the risk of breast cancer and i will tell you how to remember the mnemonics uh, that the high risk uh, of more than 4 is when you have uh, this uh, braca1 uh, braca1 or braca2 mutation okay uh, when there is radiation exposure before age 30 and uh, atypical hyperplasia and lcis so this can be remembered with mnemonics braca itself braca uh, b for braca r for radiation exposure before age 30 c for carcinoma in situ like lcis and a for atypical hyperplasia so that is how we can remember relative risk of more than 4 okay and the hormonal another trick to remember relative risk less than 2 is the hormonal associated risk factor that is early menarche late menopause early menarche means less than 11 years late menopause means more than 55 years that is also easy to remember because both are 11 and 55 multiple of 11 now nulliparity is also associated with hormone receptor estrogen progesterone hormone replacement therapy alcohol use post menopausal obesity all these are associated with hormone so all of them have relative risk with less than 2 now apart from these two uh, columns of table the remaining has relative risk of between 2 to 4 so chemo uh, chemo prevention for breast cancer now chemo prevention for breast cancer we have uh, this uh, like when we diagnose a patient with a uh, high risk breast cancer like uh, when a young women come to our clinic and it is found that uh, she has a braca her mother had a braca mutation breast cancer and uh, she was a braca positive then the daughter need to be uh, tested for genetic testing of braca and if it is positive then she also will fall under high risk patient now because because she is young she is unmarried now what are the options available for management of such type of young women so we have three main options that is she can be offered a high risk surveillance okay we'll keep her under observation let her marry let her uh, let her have child second option is chemo prevention okay we'll give her drugs so that uh, that will reduce the risk of subsequent malignant formation and third uh, third option is the risk reducing surgery that is risk reducing mastectomy and risk reducing salpingectomy so this chemo prevention is the one which is uh, which is the drug given to prevent the subsequent cancer development in the patient who is at high risk of development of cancer so what are the those drugs that can be used these are the uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators that is tamoxifen raloxifen and aromatase inhibitors that is eximestel so we have uh, this uh, tamoxifen reduces the risk uh, by all of these drugs will reduce the risk about 30 to 50% okay so so the bottom line is that they will give you the option which of the following drugs are used for chemo prevention so tamoxifen raloxifen and eximestin are there the reason why i have given these evidences because in your recent edition of sebistan they have highlighted these trials okay uh, nsabp p1 ebctcg okay and uh, Star uh, that is NSABP P2 trial. So that is why uh, we should be just knowing. They will uh, the context in which this trial has been done. Now, the main concern of a tamoxifen is that there is increased risk of uh, DVT, endometrial cancer, and pulmonary embolism. Okay, but all of these drugs will decrease 30 to 50 percent chance of subs subsequent cancer. now in uh, this um, this star uh, trial which is the 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 comparison of uh, of uh, raloxifen with tamoxifen which one is a better in case of post menopausal women and this star trial nsbp that uh, nsbp p2 trial found that 
the both are similar but the toxicity profile is better with raloxifen the uh, raloxifen is not associated with endometrial cancer it is not associated with dvt it is not associated with pulmonary embolism so that's why according to this trial uh, star trial uh, the raloxifen is preferred when uh, in the case of postmenopausal women uh, sorry uh, in postmenopausal women uh, for breast cancer while uh, for, for young women we give tamoxifen so uh, we we discussed uh, menopause menopause uh, the, the the late menopause is the uh, indication for for the uh, late menopause is that is factor for breast cancer so what is actually uh, menopause this is the definition given by nccn so whenever there is bilateral um, oophorectomy um, via surgery okay if the patient has has undergone surgery bilateral that is definitely a surgical menopause but uh, by age it is more than 65 years uh, sorry 60 years it is not the 45 or 55 that we uh, that we clinically see it is more than 60 years and when the age is less than 60 years then there should be amenorrhea for 12 months okay and uh, if age is less than 60 years there should be amenorrhea for more than 12 months with chemotherapy and if it is less than 60 months on, on tamoxifen the fsh and estradiol levels should be in post menopausal range so this is the definition of menopause in fact they had asked in my final exhibit exit dnv uh, final surgical oncology what is um, menopause so i had uh, answered this now risk assessment tools uh, with, uh, which of the following is not uh, included in the gale risk assessment model so genetic factors is not included in the risk assessment now we'll be studying the the model of risk factor uh, for breast cancer so the genetic factors is not included rest uh, we have a mena age of menarche number of biopsy okay <coughs> the is at first life birth these are the and this is a table given in shorts textbook of surgery and when the according to gale when the relative risk is more than 1.66 remember this number 1.66 when it is more than that then the, that there is a risk of breast cancer and that those patients should be recommended tamoxifen for uh, tamoxifen uh, should be recommended uh, for chemo prevention those patients now there are several other risk assessment models the gale model cross model couch model brca pro, pro model and tyrol cusick model i have uh, given uh, this table so that you can study uh, at your home all these points now uh, the, the classification of uh, primary breast cancer the non invasive 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 we further classified into several types and phylloid tumors mixed connective epithelial tumor phylloid carcinosarcoma angiosarcoma adenosarcoma so non invasive we have lcis and tcis lcis is no longer a carcinoma in situ it is a risk factor however when we have pleomorphic lcis that is that has bad prognosis and should be treated like dcis so lobular carcinoma lobular carcinoma in situ now dcis total carcinoma institute the most common dcis uh, is uh, the, the most common presentation of dcis is microcalcification on mammography and they have uh, four broad types of dcis total carcinoma institute that is papillary cribriform solid and comedo the four types and they, there is one uh, and out of these four types the two types that is papillary and cribriform are regarded as low growth low grade and and uh, they take longer time to transform into invasive cancer while the solid and comedo type are high grade and they need to be treated uh, accordingly so uh, how to treat them this is decided based on this band nice prognostic index which is used for uh, uh, for for this dcis so there was uh, one in one of the recent entrance examination a band nice prognostic index is used for and dci was DCIS was the option. So basically, in this uh, prognostic index, they have they have uh, four parameters: size, margins, grade, 
is based on that they will uh, they will score individually score one score two score three and give the final score of uh, a low score intermediate score and high score the one with a low score can be treated with just wild local excision while the one with intermediate score will be treated with a wild local excision plus radiotherapy and the high score will be treated with mastectomy so this is the difference between LCIS and DCIS, which has been given in uh, our uh, Swartz uh, textbook of surgery. The LCIS is less common, but DCIS is more common. LCIS is more associated with bilaterality and multifocality. Okay, but the histology of uh, cancer is ductal in most of the patient in the future. So margin necessary for excision of DCIS is no income tumor, one mm, two mm, one centimeter. Yes, uh, so the correct answer is C, it is 2 mm, though the mar margin uh, of ink is only uh, no tumor on ink in case of invasive ductal cancer, but in DCIS it is 2 mm, that is we need larger margin uh, in case of DCIS, that is, this is what NCCN says that in uh, cancer it is no ink on tumor, but for DCIS it, it should be at least 2 mm. The reason is that the DCIS is mostly associated with a diffuse micro classification and we may not be able to palpate. Okay. So it is ironical that IDC require margin of uh, less margin of no tumor on ink, while DCIS require more margin of 2 mm. And the best explanation for that is that uh, DCIS is associated with multifocality and we cannot palpate DCIS uh, on table while doing surgery. So we tend to are on the higher side by taking two mm margin. And this is not me, but this is the NCCN which is uh, saying us about this. So we can see that pure DCA is two mm margin. Okay, and invasive ductal cancer, no incontinuous margin. So this is from NCCN guideline. Now treatment of uh, DCIS, uh, as I said in our previous, uh, previous uh, slide, that low grade only excision while high grade, excision followed by whole breast radiation therapy of 50 grade. Okay. And this is the indications of total mastectomy in DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ. Very, uh, very nice uh, indication that is when we have diffuse suspicious macro, uh, mammographic calcification where we cannot excise the tumor uh, or micro calcification because of extensive disease. Of course, we will be tending to total mastectomy when the clear margin is not obtained with a wild local excision when there is poor cosmosis with wild local excision, when the patient is not motivated to comply with a surveillance of imaging. So all these are indication for uh, total mastectomy. Now, uh, uh, should we do sentinel lymph node biopsy? Should chemotherapy be given? Should hormonal therapy be given? Now the key thing that we need to understand that uh, in up to 20% of DCIS uh, can be upgraded to uh, invasive ductal cancer on final pathological report. Okay, so, so we need to uh, take this into picture and the, in, and the incidence of lymph node metastasis is less than 5% because there is no invasive component. The, the, the cancer has not infiltrated the basement membrane. So there is no invasive component. So the chance of lymph node metastasis is very less, less than 5%. And the chance of distant metastasis is much less, that is less than 1%. Okay. And that is why the, the chemotherapy and hormonal therapy, there is uh, no role, but we can give as, uh, as a prevention, as a uh, chemo prevention, the hormonal therapy. Okay. But chemotherapy, there is no role of chemotherapy uh, in case of uh, TCIS because there is no invasive component. Okay. And the chance of distant metastasis is less than 1%. So, no chemotherapy. Uh, and uh, hormonal therapy can be given. It is just a drug. Yes, she has to swallow. It is not a uh, for chemo prevention. And uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy is not done. But uh, but when the patients with DCIS, when we are undergoing the total mastectomy, then we can just give one attempt because there will be no best in the future to do sentinel lymph node biopsy. So if because of DCIS, we are going uh, undergoing and uh, we are contemplating this uh, total mastectomy. In that case, only sentinel lymph node biopsy is indicated; otherwise, no indication. So, so, so these are the crystal clear concept for DCIS, which I have discussed throughout. 
Now we will be discussing our topic proper that is the breast cancer. Okay. Now, so we all know that the breast cancer, the most, uh, the most uh, common type is no special type, while the special types are the uh, tubular uh, carcinoma, mucinous, medullary, invasive cribriform, invasive papillary, adenoid cystic carcinoma, metaplastic carcinoma. Okay. So uh, more than 90% of the time or up to 70, uh, 70 to 90% it is NOS, not no otherwise, otherwise specified. Now, one, at this point of time, I would like to tell about uh, the invasive lobular cancer, which is often missed. So this is the invasive lobular cancer in which uh, uh, it, uh, the invasive lobular cancer invade stroma in a single file pattern and may form concentric circles of single file cells around the normal ducts. So they are single file pattern uh, of these cells uh, known as targeted appearance. And there is loss of E cadherin uh, on ISC staining. The lobular cancer. And uh, it is usually notorious for multifocality, multicenticity, bilaterality. Okay. And because of this, uh, this loss of peak adhering uh, on ISC, it is more notorious for distant spread, like uh, meningeal spread, serosal spread, uh, is more seen in more common in lobular cancer. Now, uh, in, while in uh, infiltrating ductal cancer, which is seen in this picture, uh, in figure A, uh, here, the, uh, the tumor invades singly. Uh, the tumor cells are going uh, singly and not in uh, and not in a <coughs> single file pattern. Uh, there is no pattern here in this uh, invasive ductal cancer, and they are named uh, according to the features that they display. Like uh, here, they are uh, they are displaying in the form of form of tubule. So it is known as invasive tubular cancer. Here, uh, they are displaying in the form of uh, the form of mucin or colloid, so they are known as uh, colloid cancer. And this is medullary cancer. That the distinct feature of medullary carcinoma is that there is infiltrate of uh, lymphocytes and uh, uh, syncytium appearing seeds of tumors there. The tumor cells are large, very undifferentiated with pleomorphic uh, nuclei, usually high grade and triple negative. So associated with uh, uh, BRCA mutation, this uh, medullary type of tumor. So tumor subtypes that occur in the breast, but that are not considered to be typical breast cancer include uh, cystosarcoma, phylloid angiosarcoma, and primary lymphoma, which are <coughs> seen in breast, but not uh, originate from the TDLU, terminal ductal lobbery. So now we'll be discussing the TNM staging. This is the, uh, this is the excellent, uh, excellent staging system in case of uh, breast cancer. Now, before I uh, go into TNM classification, I will ask uh, some interesting uh, questions. Uh, who developed TNM classification? I will try to sum up TNM uh, for entire cancer in this slide. Who devised TNM uh, classification? It was the Perry Diox from, uh, from France uh, who devised the TNM classification. And he used uh, this TNM staging uh, in 1943. And for a lung, uh, carcinoma lung, it started with carcinoma lung. Now there are several prefix uh, before a TNM, that is a, a small m, large m. What is the difference between small m, large m? What is the difference between uh, a small r, capital R? Small m means multifocal, okay, multiple tumors. While a small r means recurrent tumor. While a capital R means a residual disease. How much residual disease there? Why is for denoting whether the patient has received any systemic chemotherapy or not. Okay, so which are the tumors where uh, there is only N1 uh, disease and there is no N2 and N3 disease. And these are carcinoma thyroid, uh, anal cancer, where there is no N2, N3, only N plus, that is N1 and N2 and uh, N0. Okay, uh, in which malignancy size of node is still considered instead of number of nodes. That is carcinoma testis, where the size is now considered and number, uh, so where size is still considered rather than the number. In, uh, 
in which tumor uh, the t1 is sub classified into t1 a b c like in breast it is t1 is classified into a b c in a, which other tumor it is classified like a b c it is a pancreas so so all those uh, cancers uh, i'll be uh, telling and the tricks and the trips and the analogy and the what is the comparison i'll be telling during my class a staging group of which other cancer is similar to breast cancer CA stomach, CA stomach and CA breast, you will find similar classification of this anatomical staging group. Which uh, organ has stage two better than stage one? Usually what happens stage, stage one is better, two is uh, bad, three is worse, uh, four is worst. So in which case the higher stage has better prognosis. So it is hepatoblastoma and Williams tumor. In hepatoblastoma, stage two is post chemo, and in stage one is uh, pre chemo. So that is why stage two is has better prognosis. With tumor, stage five has better prognosis than stage four. Which cancer has stage five? It is Wim's tumor. Rest of the uh, tumors have stage four only. Which, which tumor has no stage four, only stage one, two, three? That is C A testis. Which, uh, which tumor has only stage four? Anaplastic thyroid cancer. Which tumor has only stage one and two? No three and four. That is differentiated thyroid cancer less than 55 years of age. In which tumor age is taken into account? CA thyroid. In which tumor uh, grade is taken into account? Soft tissue sarcoma. Okay, so all these things will be discussed uh, and these points will be discussed in every cancer staging so that you will have a recapitulation or revision each time we discuss the TNM staging. Okay, so now before that, let us first discuss the the TNM staging in case of uh, breast cancer. Uh, so T1 is less than two centimeter, T2 is two to four centimeter, T3 is <coughs> sorry two to two five centimeter, T3 is more than five centimeter, T4, A, B, C, D, A is under that is a chest wall uh, invasion. But what is chest wall invasion? It is not pectoralis major. It is SIR. Sir, sir is serratus anterior, I for intercostal muscle and R for ribs. T4 B, T4 is Bahar, B for Bahar. So B is for when you have PUD orange, ulceration, satellite nodules, pus. B for pus, P U S pus. So PUD orange, ulceration, and satellite nodules makes the uh, T4 B. T4 C is when we have both. Okay, T4 D when you have inflammatory breast cancer. N1, N2, N3. N1, uh, N1 is ipsilateral mobile axillary lymph node. N2 is N2 A, N2 B. N2 a is ipsilateral matted node and to B is when we have ipsilateral node with axillary uh, ipsilateral internal memory nodes only and three is again further divided into n3 a and 3 b and 3 c and 3 a is when apical group of lymph nodes is involved that is level three that is infraclavicular lymph node that is halstead lymph node and 3 b is when we have uh, internal memory lymph node plus axillary lymph node and 3 c when we have uh, supracavicular lymph node so this is the clinical uh, TNM classification. We have this um, pathological also because uh, the pathological uh, N1 is when we have axillary lymph node 1 to 3, N2 when we have axillary lymph node meds uh, in 4 to 9, and when we have 10 or more axillary lymph nodes positive, then that is N3. So all uh, these points are important points and they will be asked in uh, one form or any other form. Now, we have this anatomical staging uh, group uh, in case of CA breast. Uh, so, so this is the anatomical staging group and one, uh, one, one A B, one A, one B, two A, two B, three, three A, B, C, and four. Now, the most common site of distant meds in stage four is bone, followed by liver, followed by lungs, followed by brain. And in the bone, the most common site is lumbar vertebra. Why? Because in the first two slides, I showed you the intercostal vein, which is draining into posterior intercostal vein, which is draining into paravertebral venous complex, and then Batson's plexus, and then draining into lumbar. So, uh, and one another interesting thing I would like to highlight here that the hormone receptor tumors tend to have bone metastasis more common, while the hormone receptor negative tumors like a uh, HER2 positive tumor will be going to uh, have more of the visceral metastasis like in liver, lung. 
and the lobular ca cancer because of loss of e cadherin protein they will be more uh, uh, having meningeal mets or mural mets okay or peritoneal mets so these are a unique uh, unique histological correlation uh, of the breast cancer and their metastatic potential so what are the uh, recent changes in lcis lcis lobular cancer institute is removed from the staging system as we discussed and grade and ilc detected tumor markers are incorporated in staging system so now uh, we have to include grade and ilc not in this anatomical staging group this is the anatomical staging group which is which we are using since uh, since last years but uh, in the recent uh, ajcc they have they have used this form of uh, this form of uh pathological prognostic stage now what does that mean i'll just i'll not tell in detail but let us understand this concept because these are recent changes uh, so so what they say in though the anatomical stage will tell you that it is a stage 2b because the tumor is t3 n0 or t2 n1 okay but the actual pathological prognostic group can be either more than 2b or less than 2b like if it is grade 3 okay and the uh, the Uh, er pr and hot2 all are negative so it cannot be treated as 2b it should be treated as 3e a because the prognosis is very bad the, the there is hot2 negative a hormonal receptor is negative so it has bad prognosis the, uh, the treatment implications is different and then it can all like all all code size doesn't fit all so we cannot group all of them into one category so they say that based on this uh, pathological prognostic stage though it is a t2b uh, sorry a stage 2b based on anatomical staging but it has a different prognostic stage according to pathologically and it should be treated as 3a okay this is new concept in the new ajcc and when the tumor has positive 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 okay and the grade one so it, it is in fact treated lesser than this stage it is anatomical stage 2b but the pathological prognostic stage group is 1a so it is the dynamic staging system that has been incorporated so 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 it is a important but these are not these are for the understanding what they will ask is what are what are the uh, parameters that are included for pathological prognostic stage so you have to remember this grade erp or to erp or to new receptor marker all these four parameters are included so the the basic staging uh, system uh, the basic uh, staging system that we should be doing incorporating in patients with stage 3 is usually we incorporate ct scan and bone scan okay and uh, for early stage too much depending on the uh, on the symptoms we will be doing the staging investigation so uh, again these are uh, our uh, future classes that is the next week we'll be discussing basics of general surgery every week a uh, one system and then uh, every month uh, one doubt clearing system for all the preceding system so that during your study when you come across with doubt you just note it down and during interaction with us we can ask the questions and also you will have one mock test practice uh, on our website where you will be given free access uh, to have the mock test session and compare uh, yourself with the peer groups and the highlights that i, I highlighted uh, at the beginning will have uh, all these highlights so uh, we have uh, if uh, today anybody will enroll that we will be uh, giving the early bird offer of uh, of 10000 which has now been increased to 15000 but when you enroll today you can avail this offer if you find this class worthful now we will be discussing this uh, management of uh, breast cancer and uh, we will start this hashtag concept but before that i will take 5 minute break okay and then we will start the management which we i think you should not today is a demo class you can just enjoy this class and uh, i hope uh, it will be very very useful for you so 5 minute break and then we will resume
So uh, we will resume now. So um, this is a very interesting picture, which is uh, which is taken from the time of Halstead, where uh, before the Halsteadian concept, where they used to do this uh, guillotine of the breast. So this is the instrument when they found any patient with uh, breast cancer, the Gerard Tabor had uh, uh, introduced this instrument, not as Gerard Tabor mastectomy instrument, where he used to just just like guillotine uh, he used to uh, use this instrument to cut the breast uh, entirely uh, like a guillotine and and the entire specimen was uh, delivered uh, with this sharp instrument so surgical management of the uh, breast has now evolved tremendously over time from this uh, era of guillotine to the present era of uh, of uh, the modified radical mastectomy and Best conservation surgery. So this is uh, this is the this is the uh, era of Halstead where he performed a radical uh, uh, mastectomy where he bared the entire chest. He removed the pectoralis major, pectoralis minor muscles. Okay, and uh, in the with the belief that uh, it will improve the local recurrence. However, uh, the the survival was was not. Uh, significantly changed. So at least uh, Halstead uh, did this uh, radical mastectomy and it was far better uh, than this, uh, this uh, Gerard Tabor guillotine method of uh, mastectomy. Now the history timeline, the treatment over, uh, over uh, the treatment has evolved greatly over time because uh, we have uh, moved from maximum tolerable treatment to minimum effective treatment. Like uh, like in case in case of cancer lung uh, from a pneumonectomy to uh, we have evolved uh, evolved to lobectomy in renal cell cancer we have evolved from radical nephrectomy to nephron sparing surgery. Similarly, in case of uh, management uh, uh, of uh, surgical management of breast uh, uh, cancer has evolved greatly over time from hasted radical mastectomy uh, to the present uh, era of breast conservation uh, surgery. The Halstead uh, radical mastectomy included a resection of breast, uh, but uh, it also included resection of pectoralis major and minor muscles, even if they are not involved. Now we remove the part of the pectoralis major and minor muscles when it is involved or seen uh, in the intra period. Now this evolution has uh, been influenced by several landmark papers uh, or prospective clinical trials, which has changed the clinical uh, practice uh, as well as understanding of the biology of the breast cancer. So now uh, from the Halstead concept uh, uh, of radical mastectomy, we, we move to mod, uh, we move to radical, uh, from Halstead concept of uh, radical mastectomy, we move to modified ra radical mastectomy. Uh, thanks to the paper, the NSABP B04. So NSABP is a la landmark paper. Uh, uh, NSABP is a, actually a surgical and a, a bowel Project National Surgical and Ball Project. It is uh, uh, it is it was founded by Fisher, and uh, they perform um, numer uh, numerous trials uh, every year, and they give number to that. So for your benefit, uh, I would like to tell that NSAPP B. Whenever there is B, then that means it is pertaining to breast. Whenever there is R, uh, uh, one or two or three, that is pertaining to rectum. Okay, and whenever there is NSAPP uh, P. Is, uh, pro, uh, pertaining to prevention, okay, preventive trials that are like done for the uh, for uh, chemo prevention, okay, like we discussed NSABP P2 trial, which is also known as a STAR trial, where they compared the raloxifen and atomoxifen. So, so that is there. Now, uh, another uh, another important thing that after NSABP B4, uh, it was established that. Uh, modified radical uh, mastectomy was equally enough or equally good in case of uh, overall survival when compared to radical mastectomy of Halstead because, um, because uh, the survival was similar uh, and the outcome was better. There was less morbidity. So after that, uh, there was another, uh, the search does not end uh, at this point of time and, and NSABP B06 and Milan trial was performed where they found that why should we do modified radical mastectomy? Why should we not conserve the breast? 
So they moved from a modified radical mastectomy to a breast conservation surgery. And thanks to these two uh, landmark papers that they found that the, the survival is not uh, impaired and the outcome is similar even after comparing, uh, even after performing the breast conservation surgery in case of cancer patient. So the, this, this was the landmark, uh, landmark evolution in case of breast primary. Now with time, uh, there also evolved the, the the um, involved the treatment in case of axillary management. Previously, we, we used to do a radical uh, um, axillary lymph node dissection, complete axillary lymph node dissection. But uh, but after uh, the evolution of this uh, NSAPP B32 trial, uh, he, uh, in this trial, they found that sentinel lymph node biopsy was equally good. We need not perform axillary lymph node dissection in those patients who has N0 nodes. There are no clinically nodes. Why should we perform axillary lymph node dissection. So this was the landmark paper which established that in N0 nodes, we should not do axillary lymph node dissection, rather we should do sentinel lymph node biopsy. And when it is a negative, we can completely avoid doing axillary lymph node dissection. But if provided it is positive, we should resort to axillary lymph node dissection. Followed by that, one decade later, the ECOSOC G11 trial was performed. And in this trial, they, they, they what they did do even after being positive nodes, they did not do axillary lymph node dissection. So, so, but they had some stringent criteria that if the tumor is less, uh, uh, T1 or T2, smaller in size, okay. If the patient is uh, undergoing breast conservation surgery and uh, there should be adjuvant radiation therapy, then in those selected group of patients, we can avoid doing sentinel lymph node biopsy, provided only one to two axillary lymph nodes are positive on sentinel lymph node biopsy. So these are the evolution. Now we are moving from radical surgery to, uh, to conservative surgery. Okay, and uh, because uh, there is no need of maximum tolerable treatment. We, sh we should not treat how much the patient can tolerate. We should treat how much the treatment is effective. So uh, the, the evolution of the breast cancer is both a local and distant disease. So the, uh, the old concept has stated, has given the concept that the, the tumor will uh, uh, spread with orderly anatomic uh, progression of disease such that the aggressive local treatment should improve survival. So, so that is why he removed everything that was nearby the tumor. Uh, major minor muscle from origin to insertion, he should remove it. But later, uh, Fisher, who is the father of the NSABP trial, he said that the tumor will be both systemic and uh, and uh, local uh, spread is there at the same time. So we need to give systemic therapy. So he introduced the, uh, the, uh, the role of systemic therapy. But uh, he said that, the Fisher said that the intrinsic tumor factors dictate the patterns of spread such that the systemic therapy should improve outcome. Now, the, now the, today at this point of time, we follow this Hellman concept, which is the systemic concept and he merged both the, uh, both the concept and said that the, the breast cancer fall under a heterogeneous spectrum and the optimizing both local control and systemic therapy is, is required. Means that the, the tumor is both local and systemic at, at one centimeter or at the beginning of tumor formation only. Okay, so, so in the modern era, breast cancer treatment includes local and uh, regional approaches. So, so local means that is surgery and radiation therapy. And for systemic, we give chemotherapy. Now, uh, the, the, mastic, uh, the evolution of mastectomy, as I said, uh, the radical has a concept where he removed a breast with NSC with pectoralis major, minor, and aggregate nodes. Then came the concept of modified radical mastectomy uh, uh, given by Patties, okay, uh, and which was later modified by uh, Scanlon, where what he did, he, he preserved the, uh, he, he divided the pectoralis minor muscle, okay, Scanlon, and then sutured it while the Ockin class, he retracted the uh, uh, pectoralis minor muscle. Now, what is a simple mastectomy? Simple mastectomy is uh, just uh, the removal of breast without addressing axillary nodes, okay? So still we do simple mastectomy in, uh, in cases like when the, there is fungation, okay? Right? So we do toilet mastectomy, prophylactic mastectomy, like when we do surgery for a BRCA mutated patient, risk reducing surgery, there we do not remove axillary lymph nodes. There we will be just doing um, mastectomy of the breast. Okay, so that is known as prophylactic mastectomy. 
when there is high grade DCIS, like why we discussed during the management of ductal carcinoma institute, when in malignant phylloid, in that case, we'll be doing simple mastectomy. So these are indication of simple mastectomy, that is removal of breast only, no addressal of the arterial liquid. Now, breast conservation surgery uh, is always followed with uh, RT to the breast. Breast conservation surgery is basically conserving the breast uh, by removing the, uh, the tumor while local excision. Okay. While local excision is not similar to breast conservation surgery because the component of breast conservation surgery is RT also. But in wide local excision, just like the surgical biopsy we discussed, it is just uh, removing with a margin. Lumpectomy, when we remove the, the benign tumors, quadrantectomy, when we remove the entire segment of the, of the quadrant and margin in BCS, no income tumor is the margin, which is the recent consensus. Now, reconstruction options after mastectomy. So we have done total mastectomy or modified radical mastectomy. So what options you have? This is a very beautiful table. I liked it in the debita. So, so remember one thing that BCS and breast reconstruction is different thing. The reconstruction that we do in BCS is actually oncoplasty. But the reconstruction we do after total mastectomy or modified radical mastectomy is known as breast reconstruction. So in those cases, we have to de develop or reconstruct entire breast. But in PCS, we have to just fill the defect by using any uh, local regional flaps, uh, which we'll be discussing. So for uh, breast reconstruction after mastectomy, there are several options like implant, tissue expander, LD flap, tram flap, DIEP flap, superior gluteal RT flap. So these are the several advantages and disadvantages, which I will not uh, read line by line, but you should uh, go through it while you uh, read after the class. Now, a breast reconstruction, the easiest and the simplest method is silicon gel implant okay, behind the pectoralis major muscles. And the, the flaps, what are the pedicles supplied, uh, supplying the flap, these all should be remembered. For a reconstruction of tattoo, we have uh, two options, uh, sorry, reconstruction nipple, we have uh, two options that is we can either tattoo or we can uh, use the CV flap, which, uh, which is uh, the nipple reconstruction flap. And uh, of course, we have reduction, augmentation, mammoplasty, mastopexy, contralateral symmetrization, external breast prosthesis. Now, a breast conservation surgery is basically we should uh, do lumpectomy of the tumor and regardless of the size and uh, with clear margins, oncological, it should be same. Oncological, it should be safe and uh, there should be acceptable cosmetic result. The margin again here is no income tumor and it is uh, the local recurrence after BCS are higher for younger women than for older women, but it is not a contraindication. It is higher, so he, he, she should be under follow-up. And a radiation boost to the tumor bed has been shown to reduce the local recurrence okay, after lumpectomy with negative margin in young women. And consider volume replacement if tumor resection is more than 20 to 30 percent of the breast tumor. Now there is a, one a classification known as Krishna clock classification, where he said that when you have uh, a volume plus less than 20 percent, you can just mobilize the uh, surrounding parenchyma and then fill the defect. But when you have a defect which is more than 20 to 50 percent, um, that is between 20 to 50 percent, in that case, we have to bring volume from the uh, from the regional area like. We can use mini LD flap, okay, or like uh, my gap. Also, there are several flaps which is used for reconstruction of the defect. So the main thing that I wanted to highlight here that BCS or breast conservation therapy includes the surgery part, okay, and the radiation part followed by adjuvant systemic therapy, or according to the tumor biology, according to immunohistochemistry markers. Now. Oh, so why I am going to discuss about this um, uh, breast size because this has a very important role in the concept of uh, um, breast conservation surgery in, uh, in female. So um, uh, it, uh, the breast conservation surgery, the type of incision, the type of uh, the reconstruction depend on the uh, cup size of the breast, the process of the breast. So we need to understand the cup size and uh, process. So basically the cup size can be calculated by uh, using this uh, measuring tape at the inferior mammary trees level and at the uh, nipple areola complex NSC level. Okay, suppose uh, it is the, at the NSC level, it is 36 inch and at the infra, cam, uh, infra mammary trees level, the measuring tape measures as a 30, uh, 
32 inch. Okay, so the difference between 36 and 32 is 4 inch. So once the, uh, the difference is 4 inch, the cup size becomes D. Okay, so, uh, so, the, so the, the cup size becomes D. So this the reason why I have highlighted here because this is coming up and uh, the, these are asked in exam and uh, the, the, what is the grading system used for courses, how do we calculate cup size, okay. Now the, 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 the kind of incision or the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, reconstruction, because the breast conservation surgery should appear aesthetic, the cosmetic outcome should be good with uh, better oncological control. We cannot compromise the oncological outcome by in, in search of good, uh, good or aesthetic outcome. Okay, so the, for upper pole lesions, we have these uh, several techniques that is batwing, hemi batwing, crescent mastopexy, round block technique. For lower pole lesions, we have a reduction myomoplasty, trimal incision, benelli incision, inframary jet plasty, B plasty. This is given in uh, Sebastian. Okay, so the J, the J plasty is used for um, for lateral uh, lateral outer quadrant inferior in inferior pole and B for medial medial quadrant in the lower pole. The contraindications to BCS is uh, absolute contraindication and relative contraindication. This is given in NCCN. So when there is contraindication to radiation therapy, when there is diffuse suspicious microcalcification, when there is uh, when there is inflammatory breast cancer, when there is diffuse positive breast cancer, so all those are uh, contraindications to breast. Relative, uh, you can read this uh, when there are prior. Uh, prior radiation therapy exposure, persistently positive margin, all these are contraindications for breast conservation surgery. For, and if there is contraindication to radiation, that becomes contraindication to BCS as well, because we know that radiation therapy is integral part of breast conservation surgery. Now, moving on to management of axilla. We have discussed the management of breast, the, the options available. The two main options are modified radical mastectomy, the modification, the off cross patties, scanless, and the um, BCS we have discussed. Now, at the same time, we need to know the management of axilla. And several uh, prospective, several robust data has come uh, in the axillary management, and uh, we should be, and the questions are being asked from that that part of uh, that part of this chapter. So axillary lymph node staging, the most important prognostic factor in cancer breast is axillary lymph node. The number and the presence of lymph node metastasis affect the staging as well as prognosis. So uh, uh, do you know the, the, the first negativity rate of clinical examination, like uh, on clinical examination, you may feel it is, uh, it is involved, but it may, will, turn out to be negative. So the first negativity rate is 30 to 35% uh, of the clinical examination. So that is why we cannot rely completely on clinical examination and we have to resort to some form of staging axillary in any way. So these are the, uh, these are the four forms of axillary staging. And that is the, the standard and the, the age old uh, method is axillary uh, lymph node dissection ALND followed by sentinel lymph node biopsy, targeted axillary dissection and low axillary staging. So what are these? So we'll be uh, studying line by line at the, 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 these different forms of staging. Axillary lymph node dissection is definitely indicated when we have locally advanced breast cancer, okay, LABC, inflammatory breast cancer, when we have a positive sentinel lymph node, at your level, positive sentinel lymph node is also an indication for axillary lymph node biopsy, uh, axillary lymph node dissection. But uh, there is an asterisk mark that, uh, that is for aqueous G11 criteria, which I was discussing in previous slide. And post uh, NS, uh, NSCT, if there is clinical positive nodes, then of course, or clinically, or positive sentinel nodes, then of course, we have to do axillary lymph node dissection. So ALND remains the standard of care for patients with locally breast cancer advanced breast cancer. Now, only, okay, let's, let's move to the uh, next slide. So, uh, historically, historically, ALND was a routine component of surgical management of cancer breast, but uh, it was found that uh, this ALND is associated with uh, both acute and long-term complications. Acute uh, complications in the form of uh, pain, paresthesia, there should be drain in the, in the axillary 
surgical bed, the range of motion at the shoulder joint is decreased, and the patient has longer hospitalization because need to, uh, because of pain and the drain. And the chronic complications are chronic pain, numbness, lymphedema, decreased range of motion at the shoulder joint. So the arm needs to be protected from injury as this will uh, this will uh, result in lymphangitis and lymphedema. So he, he she should be uh, in the con on continuous concern. Uh, he, she should be uh, aware that uh, there should be no injury to the ipsilateral arm uh, in the form of uh, needle prick or bangles or anything like that. So, so the, there was in fact data that suggested that ALND had significant, uh, significant comorbidities like pain, lymphedema, numbness, strength loss. Okay, and all of these parameters were statistically significant. So there came the concept of sentinel lymph node biopsy. Why should we address the, uh, the uninvolved lymph nodes and the lymph nodes which are not at risk? So the sentinel lymph node uh, is the one that came into picture. The sentinel node is basically the node that first drain the, uh, the tumor. So it is the group of lymph node or the first lymph node which receive a direct lymphatic drainage from the primary side. So if this is the tumor and uh, this is the lymphatics which is draining uh, into this lymph node. So, th so this becomes sentinel lymph node while the second and uh, third are the non-sentinel lymph node. And with this method of uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy axillary staging, it was found that even if we uh, clinically feel it is negative on a sentinel lymph node biopsy, about 25 to 30% patients were having harboring the metastasis, tumor metastasis. So it is a safe and effective alternative to routine early uh, uh, to the axillary lymph node dissection. We can perform axillary lymph node dissection, uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy and avoid the axillary lymph node dissection. And it reduced the morbidity and better quality of life with no increase in anxiety because we have stage. There is no lymph node. There is no tumor in the lymph node, so you can uh, de decrease the anxiety and improve the quality of life. So this is the NSABP B32 trial that I was talking in the history timeline, which established that sentinel lymph node dissection in patients with a breast cancer achieves the same survival and uh, regional control as axillary lymph node dissection without uh, any major side effect. And sentinel lymph node uh, can identify a node in more than 95% of the cases. So, so and the first negativity rate is also less. So this is, this is, the, this is how we do. Uh, I, I don't think I should discuss this procedure, but I will just tell you how slightly and briefly. The incision is made uh, in the lower border of the axillary hair. Okay. And then we'll just dissect it and identify the clavipectoral fossa and enters to the axillary fiber. So this is the blue line of axillary, uh, the lymphatic vessels, which is draining to the lymph node. Okay. So this is the lymphatic. So, and then when we follow this blue li line, we will reach to, reach to this group of lymph node, which is known as blue sentinel lymph node. Okay. So we are harvesting this uh, leaf node, okay. Now uh, the sentinel leaf node biopsy, we have a dual diet technique that is we should be using radio polide as well as the methylene blue. So the, the picture I showed is about methylene blue, but radio polide is used, uh, how does we, how do we use that? So in a uh, radio polite technique, see, understand the concept. We first do uh, preoperative lymphocytography, which is although not mandatory, uh, can be done and can uh, it will help to identify sentinel lymph node and document patterns of lymphatic drainage. Okay. After that, in the intra-op period, the sentinel nodes is uh, detected using this gamma probe. So this is a gamma probe. We'll place this uh, gamma probe on the tumor. What the tumor? Okay and uh, on the axillary lymph node and just compare the background activity. Here is monitor, I will show you. It is there. It is not there, okay. Oh, here it is the monitor, yeah. Here is the monitor. So once we put this gamma probe on the um, on the axillary lymph node and see the reading, okay. Suppose it is it is 400, okay. Uh, and, uh, it, uh, and when we place this gamma probe on the tumor, it is four, uh, it is 1000. So the 400 is um, 
suppose it is 500, it will be easy for me. It is 500 and here it is 1000. So the background activity is 50% uh, from the uh, original demo. So that suggests that this is uh, this is appearing that node. And once we harvest it, then uh, we'll uh, check the background activity. So the 10% rule is there. Uh, the 10% the rule is that the 10 second in vivo radioactivity count is needed to remove sentinel diffusion biopsy. We should, uh, it should not be that we will just uh, put it here and remove. We should keep it for 10 seconds and then read the uh, monitor. If it is uh, the activity is more than 10% um, of the uh, tumor activity, that suggests it is a positive lymph node. Okay, and that should be removed and that should be sent for histopathological examination. Okay, the uh, advantages and disadvantages of a blue dye and radiopolide. I think you can uh, read uh, this is a table very nicely given. Another another important uh, uh, technique of doing sentinel lymph node is endocyanin green. These are the several advantages. We don't need a um, gamma camera. We don't need a nuclear medicine department. We just need to inject this uh, endocyanin grip and we can identify the lymphatics. This is ECOSAC G11, which I was uh, talking about. The, uh, what they did, uh, the sentinel lymph node, positive, even the positive patient, he randomized them into two groups. One was underwent uh, ALND and another went uh, underwent just observation. And they had a strict criteria. It should be a less than five centimeter tumor, T1, T2. And there should be no adeno, uh, no axillary lymph node uh, palpable. One or two sentinel lymph node metastasis on HID E stain, and all of them underwent uh, breast conservation surgery and adjuvant whole breast irradiation and adjuvant system therapy. And they found that the cent the, the, the ten year rates of uh, local recurrence free survival was. 80% and overall survival was 66%, which was almost similar or better than the axillary lymph node dissection. So it was uh, one of the, uh, so we can uh, avoid axillary lymph node dissection even in positive patient according to this ECOSAC G11. But this is not used in our Indian, uh, we can't use it blindly because the Indian population has different type of cancer. Most of the Indian tumors are negative tumors, triple negative tumors, okay. Uh, he, while that in the trial, they had all were hormone receptor positive and good biology tumor they had. Okay, okay, you just, you just can ignore that. Now, uh, this is NCCN guideline, uh, where, uh, how do we approach uh, the, uh, the uh, clinically NG2 nodes? We'll do sentinel lymph node, and if the node is negative, no axillary dissection. Well, if sentinel lymph node is positive, okay, then, uh, then we have to see whether it is meeting the ECOSOC G11 criteria. If it is meeting the axillary ECOSOC G11 criteria, yes to all, then no uh, axillary surgery because we'll be giving radiation therapy. But if it is not meeting anyone, then we have to uh, do axillary lymph node dissection. And if sentinel node is not identified um, because of any reason, then we have to do axillary dissection to be on safer side. So now uh, gone are the days when we used to do sentinel lymph nodes biopsy uh, in the upfront patient. Now even after post new adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, if the previous uh, node positive patient is turning out to be non-negative, we can do uh, SLNB even in those patients. But uh, there are several advantages and disadvantages also. Uh, the advantage is that we can avoid axillary lymph node disadvantages, but the greatest disadvantage is that because of a new adjuvant chemotherapy, there will be some modification in the lymphatic drainage, okay, and it has high false negativity rate. Now, the false negativity rate is a key thing in the management of a sentinel lymph node biopsy, okay, because what does false negativity rate mean? If the false negativity rate is high, it means that you are falsely the you are falsely leaving the positive axillary uh, leaf node because if you are thinking it is negative and you are not removing the positive leaf nodes and it will be missed uh, in the axilla so it will there will be high chance of local recurrence so higher the first negativity rate means there is high chance of local recurrence okay so these are several uh, several uh, trials uh, prospective randomized control trials which evaluated uh, Sentinel lymph node biopsy after new adjuvant chemotherapy. The reason why I have put up this uh, table is because it was asked in my entrance examination 
okay uh, when i um, appeared for entrance examination in neat they had asked this question about what is the number of sentinel leaf node biopsy to have uh, to have less false negativity rate uh, according to sentinel trial the question was framed like that and the options given were 1 2 3 4 okay so i had the concept that more the number of nodes the, the first negativity rate will decrease so i marked the number 4 but the, the actual answer after i went through uh, in the, this table is given in uh, debita so the final answer was it was 3 uh, but uh, i had marked 4 so the answer is 3 with a more than 3 uh, the leaf node the first negativity rate decreases to 7% okay so so that is why i have put up this slide and uh, minimum 3 nodes should be removed after post nsct so uh, Uh, th these are three randomized control trials: Equestrian Z one zero seven one Sentinel and Asymphonic trial, uh, which is uh, post NSCT uh, Sentinel lymphoid biopsy. Now another uh, very uh, uh, very popular uh, popular uh, topic uh, that is targeted axillary dissection uh, is uh, used. So, uh, what is targeted axillary dissection? to improve the accuracy of axillary staging following nsct we do we do this axillary uh, targeted axillary dissection what we do uh, during initial part of my presentation i told that the usg is used to place marker or clip also so when we find n1 disease we will clip that node okay by ultrasound guided okay the the biopsy proven axillary node and we will give chemotherapy after chemotherapy when uh, the disease has shrunk in we we'll remove this uh, mark clip node uh, during our axillary uh, sentinel lymph node uh, during your, our axillary dissection and that is known as targeted axillary dissection this is done to decrease the first negativity rate number 1 number 2 to identify the positive node which uh, which was uh, which was positive before new adjuvant chemotherapy so this is this is the procedure how we do uh, it may be boring to you but uh, but uh, if you have in doubt i will tell in the next class okay how do we do it so now low axillary sampling what is low axillary sampling low axillary sampling is basically given by tata memorial hospital tms what they do in the low resource setting like when you do not have radio uh, colloid or when you have do not have central lymphoid biopsy we can use this method of axillary sampling where we will be uh, removing the nodes which are below the uh, intercostal brachial nerve so it is uh, anatomically defined it is less subjective more objective more standard more uniform without any inter observer variability and the first negativity rate is similar to snmb the standard snmb so the first uh, the, the boundary of low axillary sampling so this is the superior boundary that is intercostal brachial nerve medially uh, anteriorly it is the lat uh, lateral border of the pectoralis major muscle okay the uh, posteriorly it is the lateral border of the latissimus dorsi muscle and the superiorly it is intercostal brachial nerve medially it is second digit of the serratus anterior muscle so all the leaf nodes which are here are removed and that is known as low axillary sampling so this is also another form of axillary staging so basically there are four uh, forms of axillary staging as leaf node dissection sentinel leaf node biopsy targeted axillary leaf node dissection and the fourth is low axillary sampling so we have discussed the surgery now we will be discussing the radiation therapy radiation therapy is also used for local control so the, the two treatment modality that is used for local control is surgery and radiation therapy and systemic therapy is used for uh, for or chemotherapy is used for systemic control of the disease now radiation therapy of course uh, post bcs we give radiation therapy and the dose is 50 gray uh, is given 2 gray per day for uh, 25 fraction and then after that will be giving boost so that is why we clip uh, in the cavity area after performing breast conservation surgery so that we can identify the area to be boosted now post mastectomy radiation therapy indications when the tumor size is more than 5 cm <coughs> that is more than t2 when uh, or t4 disease a uh, skin in a chest wall involvement b skin involvement node positivity is there when the margin is positive and also in stage 2 tumor when all these uh, all these high risk features are present like extra capsular extension lymphovascular invasion younger patient close positive margin okay 
all this trial. Now, this MRS trial was the trial where they gave, uh, as I said, uh, that sentinel lymphoid biopsy positive can undergo surgery. But in MRS trial, uh, the, the RT people found that, that sentinel lymphoid biopsy positive, you can give RT and then and that address the disease. So, so this is also one of the uh, one of the indication of radiation therapy. So uh, now, as I said, the treatment is evolving. The, from previous uh, 25 days of uh, radiation therapy, now the duration of radiation therapy has been decreased. Now we did not give uh, for three weeks. Now we can, uh, sorry, uh, six, five weeks. How do people give radiation? They will give Monday to uh, Monday to fr Friday, five days of week. Okay, Saturday, Sunday, two days off for the patient. Again, they will call next week. Okay five days like this they will give for five weeks per day they will be giving two fractions so, so total five weeks uh, five weeks uh, of uh, five days each five five are 25 and they will be giving two fractions each so this will amount to 50 fractions okay so that that used to be a long protracted treatment and then there there came development of this decent advances where they will be just giving uh, hypo fractions that is they will be giving for three weeks only but the dose they will increase. So that is known as hypofraxis. And the trial responsible for that is start A and start B trial, where they will be giving only 40 gray and in 15 fraction, that is for three weeks. Okay. These are the several trials. You can go through this PowerPoint after the class. Now, uh, the fast forward, uh, up, the, 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 the RT people were not happy with even after three weeks of therapy. Now they develop fast and fast forward concept. So what they do, they do in fast, they will give only five fraction of the radiation therapy. Once weekly, they will be giving, okay, uh, about uh, uh, about uh, four fraction of four grade per fraction once a week uh, for five week. And in fast forward, they will give daily, okay, uh, for five days, just in one week treatment over. One week, five days, uh, they will be giving per day, okay, four, four, uh, four to five grade and then the treatment is over. So that is fast forward trial. This, this is the name of trial, fast forward trial, fast forward trial. Now this is given in, in your submission and you must go through the accelerated partial breast irradiation. I'll try to give you the concept, what is accelerated partial breast irradiation. So now what happened after breast conservation surgery, it was found that the, 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 the recurrence that used to occur, it used to occur in the tumor bed mostly. So why, why don't we radiate the tumor bed area um, uh, and uh, it reduce the chance of recurrence? So the concept of axial partial breast radiation, that is partial breast means we are not irradiating whole breast. We are irradiating the, just the area of the breast that is at risk of recurrence and accelerated because they will be giving just five days treatment. Okay, and that can be performed with the brachytherapic catheters and balloon catheters or external beam radiation. So these are uh, these are the methods of delivery of radiation therapy, external beam radiation therapy, where they will be giving radiation from several uh, uh, several external uh, beam, uh, and this is brachy brachytherapy catheters where they will be inserting the uh, catheters okay inside the body like this is brachytherapy catheters. Okay, and this is the external beam radiation. They are giving radiation from uh, several areas. Okay, and this is the catheter is placed inside the cavity that is at risk of increased local recurrence. And uh, the, the radiation is given. A total of 10 treatments that twice daily they will be giving uh, 3.4 to 3.8 gray. So the advantages of this, uh, this, this modality is that the, the treatment is sought only five days compared to five to six weeks of external beam radiation therapy and that to whole breast. There was uh, there is less scatter radiation we are giving to a localized area so the the organ at risk that is lungs heart and coronary vessels are let, less at risk okay of radiation toxicity and there is less skin burning and desquamation uh, as we are giving targeted uh, targeted uh, radiation delivery so so this has led to the development of accelerated partial based radiation. Now the questions are not asked how they are given, why they are given. The questions is asked who are given. So we know we need to know this concept of uh, American Society of Radiation uh, Oncology, okay, Astro Guideline, so the suitable group. And this was uh, this is frequently asked, no doubt. Okay, the when the, the woman is elderly, when the tumor size is less than two centimeter, when it is two one tumor, when you have done R one, uh, when you have done R zero resection, okay, negative margin, when it is 
ductal uh, IDC invasive ductal cancer type. Okay, when uh, there is no DCIS, the grade is can be any. The hormone receptor is positive. All good factors. So it is suitable group. You can give a accelerated partial breast irradiation. So you remember this suitable group. You remember about this unsuitable group. You will automatically remember this question. This is how you can remember. And there are tumor patient factors, tumor factors, nodal factors, treatment factors. Try to remember everything in a heading. Like, like this table is beautifully given. What are the patient factors? What are the tumor factors? What are the nodal factors, T and N, uh, and what are the treatment factors which should be considered for accelerated partial irradiation? Now let's test ourselves with this uh, MCQ. Which of the following statement is true regarding systemic therapy in breast cancer? So NSABP P1 is a prevention trial for aromatase inhibitor. Amoxifen reduces annual risk by 17% and death by 25%. If you people are aware, please answer. So the answer is a T, uh, TDM1 has emise bound to anti hot to eject. Okay, so NACT does not lead to improve OS in any channel. This is this is this. Now the new adjuvant chemotherapy imp improves the overall survival. Trend, there is trend to uh, improve overall survival, especially in triple negative breast cancer. Okay, uh, like um, where there is a PCR, so you can't say this is wrong in any scenario. I told you, always is always wrong, never is never right. So, so that you you need to remember that. Now the evolution of chemotherapy. Previously we have um, CMF. Was the first line of chemotherapy, then came the FSE, FC, 4AC, addition of Texas. So, this is the evolution of chemotherapy, and now it is at the dose dense paclitaxel. Okay. For uh, women who uh, need chemotherapy, um, sequential chemotherapy, that is anthracycline and taxel based treatment, is the gold standard. Okay. So, at this point of time, I would like to uh, give you some extra bit of information. So, we all talk about uh, multi uh, or chemotherapy regimen or multi uh, multi drug regimen um, but there are still some tumors where we give mono chemotherapy so uh, if you are aware it is good otherwise i'll tell you so this uh, hepatoblastoma is the tumor where we use only cisplatin single drug choriocarcinoma or uh, gestational trophoblastic neoplasia is the tumor where you, we use single drug that is methotrexate okay stage 1 seminoma where you use single drug carboplatin so these are a special situation where you use single drug. Otherwise, rest of the tumors will be using multiple drugs. And, and one interesting thing about chemotherapy is that chemotherapy works most effectively when the tumor volume is small and, uh, and still in its linear growth phase. Okay. So what is the advantages of chemotherapy? Uh, the advantage is that it will facilitate the breast conservation. Okay. It can uh, render the inoperable tumors operable. Okay, and we, we can prognosticate the patient because the triple negative uh, breast cancer and HOT2 uh, positive breast cancer will, uh, which, uh, will, will respond very nicely to the chemotherapy. This is known as triple paradox because even though the tumor is bad, okay, triple negative breast cancer, the, the response to chemotherapy is very good. So that is known as triple paradox of triple negative breast cancer. And it allows the time for uh, genetic testing, breast reconstruction. Uh, we have time we, while doing um, while uh, the patient is undergoing uh, chemotherapy. We can plan the uh, breast reconstruction. Okay, uh, and uh, we can leave for uh, genetic testing. Okay, and uh, of course it gives uh, opportunity for sentinel lymphoid biopsy if the node positive will becomes N zero after new adjuvant chemotherapy. But the greatest disadvantage of new adjuvant chemotherapy is that possible over treatment if we think that it is uh, over uh, if we overestimate the clinical stage possible under treatment if we uh, if, if our clinical stage is underestimated and the possibility of tumor progression 
uh, during the chemotherapy if it is not responding. So these are the advantages uh, that it, uh, the, the, the breast conservation ratio has increased. Now, what are the indications? If teacher will um, not ask you what are the benefits. They will ask you what are the indications of PF chemotherapy. So inflammatory breast cancer, bulky nodal disease, T3 and 3, T4 disease. <coughs> One important point I would like to uh, highlight here is that the HOT2 positivity and triple negative breast cancer, even if it is two centimeter tumor, operable tumor, and uh, of we have to give chemotherapy upfront. Okay, even the tumor is resectable, small, two centimeter. We have to give new adjuvant chemotherapy for even for two centimeter, provided the tumor is triple negative breast cancer and the uh, or HOT2 positive. And of course, if there is large tumor to breast ratio, not positivity, in that case also we have to give this chemotherapy. So, uh, so this was the NSFP B27 trial, which uh, introduced the taxons uh, in the uh, systemic therapy. So these are trials, I think uh, you, uh, you can read it. It is a simple sentence. You can read it. There is no any concept in that. Now the, uh, now the sequence of chemotherapy. So first, now, uh, in a breast cancer patient, suppose a patient comes with a breast cancer, then what you will do? You, if it is LABC, you will first get chemotherapy, then surgery, and then radiation therapy, followed by hormonal therapy if, if uh, it is hormone positive. The important concept here is that now we don't sandwich the chemotherapy. Previously, we used to give three cycle of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, surgery, and then three cycle of uh, chemotherapy. No. Now, you complete the chemotherapy before. Okay, there are uh, enough evidence, robust evidence data that has said that uh, doing this has better outcome than uh, doing sandwich therapy. Now, uh, oncotype DS is the burning hot topic. Uh, the gene expression assays uh, for considering adjuvant system therapy. Now, why why oncotype DX? Why this has come up? Because the this 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 gene expression assays help us to avoid. Uh, giving unnecessary chemotherapy uh, in selected group of patients, like I'll tell you. The oncotype DX will help us to calculate one score, okay, that is known as a recurrence score. So, this is the recurrence score, okay, this will uh, help to calculate the recurrence score. So, once the recurrence score is less than um, some say 11, some say uh, 15, okay, but suppose it is less than, uh, less than 15, uh, 11, then we can avoid giving chemotherapy. There is no role of giving chemotherapy in those patients. While uh, for those patients who have oncotypes more than 26, we have to give chemotherapy. Okay. So it will help us to avoid chemotherapy in those patients who have the recurrence score of less than 11. Okay. So that is why. Now, oncotype DX is done when? It is done when the patient has hormone receptor positive, but clinically N0. So this uh, oncotype DX is 21 gene assay. When a hormone receptor is positive, when a node is negative, in that case, in order to establish whether we can avoid chemotherapy, because chemotherapy has uh, several toxicity. So if you can avoid chemotherapy in selected group of patients, we can uh, we need to do oncotype DX. Okay, uh, and if the recurrence score is less than 11, we can avoid. And if it is more than 25, so remember this number. This is based on data from Telarax study okay and and if it is more than 25 and then of course we have to give chemotherapy and for the, the, the those tumors who have recurrence score less than 11 we uh, we avoid chemotherapy and give hormonal therapy only because it is a hormone receptor positive similarly at the mama print there are several other uh, gene expression assays like a mama print which is 70 gene prosigna which is 50 gene uh, uh, endopredict uh, uh, which is 12 gene and BCI is uh, another way of gene expression assays. And this is how, but uh, these are very costly measures. Uh, one oncotype DX will cost you around 1.5 lakh. And these are for celebrity, like some people, uh, some uh, actors will avoid getting chemotherapy provided they have less recurrence score. For them, we avoid. Uh, for them, we can use those oncotype DX or the, those patients who are very keen on, on avoiding uh, chemotherapy. Okay. 
but uh, there are some other uh, cheap tools also so that is uh, like a predict a score these are online tools we can use fill up this data the, the website name is given here and then you can calculate the reference score and uh, determine the achievement score this is another online tool you can just use this online uh, uh, website link and then know which patient should receive which kind of academic chemotherapy now i'll try to discuss uh, shortly uh, quickly briefly and quickly about the systemic therapy systemic therapy is uh, used to treat, uh, treat and prevent the recurrences of the microstatic uh, breast cancer and these are the uh, anthracycline and taxin groups the two drugs are doxorubicin and epirubicin among the anthracycline and taxin pertussis and docetaxel so uh, regimens are ac caf cef and if hr2 positive we will giving hr2 uh, receptor positive targeted therapy that is herceptin okay and the uh, uh, trastuzumab there is also pertuzumab and lapatinib is oral tamoxifen can in where tdm1 is this tdm1 is given in, even in belly so it is important okay it is used in breast cancer hr2 positive breast cancer this is what is this how they are given i will be discussing in detail in the subsequent slide now the i think it will be too much for you but uh, just remember that the uh, based on the response we can tailor the treatment in adjuvant setting like uh, if you are because these are recent concept and the teacher are very fond so if uh, in uh, in ini ss or in ms pgi jipmar they will ask this question which is a hot topic and and the teachers are very 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 much fond of listening this so i have put up this slide so suppose a patient is triple negative breast cancer okay and uh, there are two patient one is triple negative breast cancer and another, another is hr2 positive breast cancer so first i will discuss triple negative breast cancer in triple negative breast cancer you have given new adjuvant chemotherapy okay ac followed by t okay and then you have done the surgery after surgery in the histopathological report you see that there is no residual disease okay that is one scenario and another scenario is if there is some residual disease so if there is no residual disease we will continue the remaining part of the heart uh, uh, remaining uh, remaining if there is a triple negative breast cancer okay and if there is a residual disease then we will give capox adjuvant capsit uh, adjuvant capsitamine okay if there is no residual disease uh, sorry if there is some residual disease we will give it, give adjuvant capsitamine but if there is no residual disease chemotherapy is not given okay and hormonal therapy is given based on based on the uh, hormonal receptor because this is triple negative breast cancer no hormonal therapy only capsitabin and olaparib is given and also uh, pembrolizumab for triple negative what if it is triple uh, pos if it is hr2 positive then we have to give uh, give this tdm1 if it is hr2 positive and there is residual disease after uh, after neoadjuvant chemotherapy and surgery so these are based on two new data that is a uh, createx trial and uh, catherine trial I'm, i'm sure it will be asked in iniss because it is a very burning topic okay now uh, now what are the regimens that are given uh, for a breast cancer for that to understand we need to have divide the uh, breast cancer into two main groups that is hr2 negative and hr2 positive because a hr2 negative has different set of regimen and a hr2 positive has different set of regimen the hr2 positive has a hr2 negative group we keep ac followed by t that is atriamycin uh, that is uh, doxorubicin uh, cyclophosphamide followed by paclitaxel okay this is the main prime drug standard treatment for hr2 negative and triple negative while for hr2 positive we will give we will be giving taxin plus anti hr2 therapy that is trastuzumab okay now in the hr2 positive uh, the concept of dual dual hr2 blocker has come that is docetaxel carboplatin and uh, trastuzumab so uh, and uh, docetaxel carboplatin trastuzumab and pertuzumab so if the patient can tolerate then we will be giving double blocket okay this is based on trial but uh, i think that will be too much for you so um, uh, uh, these are the regimens for uh, just understand that the 
regimen is uh, uh, for HER2 negative, it is AC followed by T, and for HER2 positive, it is factory taxel plus HER septin. If possible, we can give TCHP and TCH regimen. Now, how does tumor respond? So it is not like if you give uh, chemotherapy, the, the tumor will respond concentrically and, and decrease a smaller from four centimeter to one centimeter. It is not like that. The response is uh, two types. Either it is Swiss cheese or centripetal type. Swiss cheese means um, the patchy response, like uh, this is the sweet cheese or honeycomb pumba pattern, where you can see this is the tumor, this is the size of the tumor, but the response is patchy patchy. Okay. There is no tumor, this is tumor, this is tumor, this is tumor. And this is the concentric re, uh, response, where there is, uh, the tumor is shrinking concentrically, okay, from four centimeter to one centimeter, while there is honeycomb. So the, 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 the chance of missing the disease is very high in this kind of response, the honeycomb or Swiss cheese pattern of response. And based on that response, uh, the, the concept of residual cancer burden has come up, okay. Just remember that uh, when there is some uh, disease remaining, that is known as residual cancer burden. And that is again divided into how, how, what is the load of the tumor, okay, one, two, three. And when there is um, more residual cancer burden, then we have to tailor our adjuvant treatment based on, based on what I said, createx uh, uh, trial and catherine trial. So now, uh, what kind of response we have, like a pathological complete response? What is the definition of pathological complete response? The patient has been operated and on histopathological examination, we'll find no tumor. No tumor either in the breast, no tumor either in the node. So that is known as total pathological complete response. So absence of invasive cancer in uh, breast and axillary nodes, irrespective of the DCIS component, it is total pathological complete response. There are other definition also like uh, uh, breast PCR, German PCR, but uh, what we follow is total PCR. Okay, so you must know this total PCR. This you can remember if you are interested. Now, what are the tumors that ha have higher likelihood of PCR? Means you have given new adjuvant chemotherapy, you have done surgery, and there is no disease in the histopathological report. So when the patient is young, when the tumor size is small, when the histology is ductal, when there is high proliferative index, when the grade is high, when the hormone receptor is negative, and when it is basal cell like or hard to uh, entry. So there, we have high chance that there will be no tumor uh, on histopathological report. While the, those contrasting uh, characteristics will have lower likelihood of achieving pathological complete response. So that is why, because of this uh, kind of pathological complete response, we need to deploy the clip. We need to put the clip in this uh, small triple negative HER2 positive breast cancer. So, uh, so that after chemotherapy, see that there is no tumor. How will you go and dissect the tumor? So that is why we deploy the clip. And this is another important uses of ultrasonography. Ultrasonography guided will put the clip. See the tumor clip has been placed inside the tumor. And after chemotherapy, there will be there will be no tumor, and you will go and just uh, identify the clip and remove it. We localize that clip with the help of wire guided localization and bracketing, okay, like this part. And then we remove. So, this is how we use wire guided localization. And after removal, we must we must do this special mammography, which is known as specimen mammography, to see if we have incorporated the, the, the localized and clip and we have incorporated the micro calcification. So back bracketing, if the area is large, so we have to use two wires, two hook wires, uh, like a bracket, and we need to remove all of them. So, so this is how uh, we uh, remove uh, the tumor uh, by the uses of this, uh, by the uses of this uh, wiring and bracketing. So this is radioactive seed localization. Okay. Now we'll discuss the endocrine therapy. I hope I am clear till now. Uh, we'll take five minute break and I think we are, uh, we'll, we'll complete soon, hopefully.
so we will resume the uh, we have so far we have discussed the surgical aspect the axillary management the systemic chemotherapy okay now we will be discussing the endocrine therapy in breast cancer the endocrine therapy is very important because because for those tumors who have hormone receptor positive uh, we can give the endocrine therapy and uh, the patient will be having better prognosis so uh, so throughout a time there, there is uh, several evolution in the uh, chemo, uh, endocrine treatment drugs and uh, like uh, this time and suggest that now the the evolution is from surgical oophorectomy to the uh, therapeutic uh, uh, therapeutic efficacy of the tamoxifen so there are uh, several uh, uh, drugs like uh, SERM, selective estrogen receptor modulator tamoxifen, okay, and tamoxifen, raloxifen. We have androgens, progesterone, okay, and aromatic uh, inhibitors like Alex, anestrazol, letrozole, and exibimestin. Okay, uh, steroid uh, anti-estrogens, falbestrin, LNRH agonist, buccinolin, niprolyte. Okay. Now, basically, how do they act? They will, they will, they will just uh, target the estrogen receptor at one level, okay, and uh, they will like a selective estrogen receptor modulator will be agonistic at one side and antagonistic at another side. So, the tamoxifen is uh, agonistic uh, in case of breast, but it is antagonistic. Uh, sorry, antagonistic in breast, but it is agonist in in case of uh, uterus or bone or liver or pituitary, and that is how. Uh, and these are responsible for the side effects like it, because of its agonistic activity in uterus there is risk of endometrial hyperplasia and cancer okay the t half is 7 to 14 days uh, it is metabolized in liver so main thing we'll be discussing clinical uh, clinical uh, scenario and clinical case uh, clinical discussion rather than the theory so the most breast cancer more than 60 Percent will express the ER or PR or both. And the tamoxifen is a selective estrogen receptor modulator that has uh, antagonistic and weak uh, agonistic effect. It helps to decrease the breast cancer recurrence rate and the mortality rate. The dose is 20 mg daily based on this trial, uh, NSABP B14 trial. Uh, and now the concept is for long duration endocrine therapy, that is 10 years. Previously, the five year was established by this famous trial B14, B for breast, okay, NSABP trial. And uh, uh, 10 year is based on the, <coughs> excuse me, Atlas and Atom trial. Now, endocrine therapy has been associated with uh, significant reduction in the risk of local recurrence, uh, distant mates, and contralateral breast cancer as well. So, it has reduced the annual uh, risk reduction of recurrence and breast by 15 to 20%. And the absolute benefit was seen where there was uh, the treatment extended to 10 years, okay, rather than 5 years. So, now the recommendation is minimum 7 years, but it can be given up to 10 years. The aromatase inhibitors uh, has uh, also greatly evolved. Uh, like there was previously first generation aminobutyl thiol that has several toxicity. Then fatrozole was the second generation, and then we have Alex uh, in the third generation. Alex is the mnemonics that you can use to remember: anastrozole, uh, letrozole, and exibimestin. Okay, Alex and uh, anastrozole is given one mg, uh, and uh, Lectrozole is given 2.5 mg OD, every hormonal therapy OD, okay, and 25 mg uh, OD for exime stain. So these are the several individual drug uh, properties, and, and these are the trials that established the, the role of hormonal uh, therapy uh, in case of upfront, sequential, and the extended. The arom uh, aromatase inhibitors, Alex, uh, the anastrozole one mg daily for five years. The main disadvantage of uh, of both of the uh, whether it is a tamoxifen, okay, a CRM, or it is aromatase inhibitor. The main uh, disadvantage is hot flushes, night sweats, and 
and sexual dysfunction that is vaginal dryness so how do they act you can see in this uh, picture the aromatic uh, inhibitors will block uh, the uh, conversion of this uh, uh, androestrogen diene and testosterone uh, to the estrogen okay and then uh, there will be anti estrogenic effect now what do the uh, esco guidelines say according to esco guideline if women are premenopausal or perimenopausal who have uh, received uh, five years of adjuvant tamoxifen then we should offer total duration of 10 years of tamoxifen and if the patient has become postmenopausal now then we have and have received five years of adjuvant tamoxifen then switch on to aromatase inhibitor total there should be 10 years okay including aromatase and and tamoxifen now ovarian ablation suppression should be done in premenopausal women that is who is uh, who is at high risk of breast cancer subsequent recurrence okay in those patient uh, we have to give tamoxifen in addition to ovarian suppression so these are the trials and um, text and soft trials which was uh, used to compare uh, the uh, ovarian ablation uh, the benefit of ovarian or suppression or ablation uh, in addition to uh, giving the anti anti hormonal therapy drugs now biological therapy that is her anti hot two inhibitor so adjuvant therapy hot two block it now we have these several new drugs also which are coming as a targeted therapy uh, and angiogenesis inhibitor pi3k inhibitor cdk46 inhibitor remember these these are recent drugs and hot topic uh, cdk46 inhibitor definitely they are they had in fact asked in our final exit uh, dnb uh, surgical oncology what are uh, in ten mark question cdk4 inhibitors and p3ca inhibitors this is pi3k inhibitor so uh, the, <coughs> the the inhibitor cdk46 we have alpocyclib abivacyclib riboscyclib okay pi3k inhibitor are alpinisib remember the drugs at least at, because they will ask which of the following is pi3k inhibitor and the options will be given all the options will be given either a parp inhibitor or cdk inhibitor so that is how uh, the, the the ini institute can ask the question now the her uh, family of uh, receptors we have uh, is uh, her one her, there are four basically uh, her receptor okay her one uh, her two her three and her four her one is egfr is also known as egfr okay and the drugs that will act are uh, arlotinib gefitinib cetuximab and her two anti her two which we uh, we call uh, commonly is the direct drug acting on it is the trastuzumab and pertuzumab now the duration for which this anti her two should be given is a one year or a 17 that is known as 17 cycles so they have increased the uh, survival very much and her two is even given for high grade dcis if it is her two positive so these are the trials which have supported the use of adjuvant uh, trastuzumab in case of Uh, in case of how to positive breast cancer and the optimal duration is one year it is not two year there was a trial called hira trial this hira trial established that giving additional uh, one year that is more than uh, that is for two years has no benefit in comparison to giving adjuvant uh, herceptin for one year so again the old slide that is uh, the for how to negative we have ac followed by t and for how to uh, positive we have TH, TCH, and TCHP regimen. It is just for revision. Okay. Same thing. Targeted therapy. Okay. CDK inhibitor that I so uh, was talking about. These these are the examples. So they may not all accept. Which of the following is is uh, PI3K inhibitor? So they will be giving uh, options like a palbocyclib, abimacyclib, ribomasalpin, and alpilisib. Alpilisib is the PI3K inhibitor. Okay, and PARP inhibitors. We are uh, we know what is PARP inhibitors. These are uh, these are also new drugs. These are given especially in case of BRCA mutated patients when when there is triple negative breast cancer and on evaluation it is found that the patient is having BRCA mutation. In those patients we have to give olaparib, bupaparib, niraparib, and belaparib. Okay, so now the the breast cancer uh, spreading breast cancer. is almost over now we are discussing miscellaneous topic like inflammatory breast cancer male breast cancer pregnancy and benign breast disease okay 
what is the area of inflammation involved in the breast cancer in case of inflammatory breast cancer this 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 is very easy still it was asked in imi ss or a neat ss so the answer is one third of the uh, when one third of the breast uh, circumference is involved more than one third it is the inflammatory breast cancer so what is inflammatory breast cancer it is uh, rare but it is very aggressive variant the stage is t4b there is rapid onset it will mimic the breast abscess or because it is painful swollen it is warm to touch uh, and there is cutaneous edema okay and it involves at least one third uh, there is rapid progression within 3 to 6 months okay and there may not be palpable mass so that is what it makes it uh, more confusing so the presence of tumor cells uh, with the dermal lymphatics is uh, is is uh, is a pathological hallmark there should be very aggressive approach keep all the treatment possible before surgery and then do surgery and immediately start the the uh, the radiation therapy uh, this is uh, in fact a contraindication for breast conserving surgery this is contraindication for sentinel lymphoma biopsy okay because of extensive dermal involvement so the difference between this is table taken from swartz the difference between inflammatory and non inflammatory breast cancer you all can go through after the class so this is how lymphatic obstruction a, uh, can uh, uh, appear in case of breast cancer this is simple or easy, simplest form of lymphatic obstruction that is pd or r then comes this cancer in cures where the the chest wall is infiltrated with carcinoma like a pore and this is lymphedema of arm you can see the 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 left hand is swollen like a elephant leg and this is the lymphadenal sarcoma the lymphedema converting to sarcoma after after uh, latent period of 1 to 2 years or after uh, 4 to 5 years okay so how uh, this is how the the lymphatic obstruction can uh, present itself and that is why we must understand how can we prevent this lymphedema and one of the thing we uh, we uh, went through was the sentinel lymph node biopsy was important to prevent this lymphedema and basically what is lymphedema so it is swelling of the arm or the breast caused by accumulation of protein rich fluid uh, in the extracellular spaces and due to disturbed lymphatic drainage like blockage in the lymphatic channels now who are the risk factors so all these are the risk factors uh, uh, okay the obesity lack of physiotherapy okay is hypertension and treatment related are the auxiliary surgery snn versus ald breast conservation surgery radiation therapy chemotherapy okay the main thing that we need to understand in this classification international society of lymphology isl classification so uh, zero is soft clinical one is when a limb elevation reduces the swelling two is uh, may not have pitting edema but limb elevation does not reduce the swelling two um, um, is a late a two is for the divided into two late stage that is uh, tissue fibrosis is more evident and the last stage is elephantiasis okay statically elephantiasis we can measure it using this pinching pinching method and measuring tape okay and this is the criteria there are several criteria to define based on volume based on arm circumference okay rather than that i will discuss you how to prevent that okay so this is icg based on uh, ihcc which will be injecting uh, in the interweb space and then we will be seeing the uh, lymphangiography to uh, to know the pattern of distribution the fluorescence pattern so this is early stage where there is a linear flow pattern this is there is a splashing this is uh, mild this is moderate stardus and this is severe form of lymphedema okay and why this is i am discussing this because now they had asked how do you surgically manage the the lymphedema so you need to understand this lymph lymphovenous anastomosis and vascularized lymph node transfer liposuctions that are done in case of lymphedema treatment this is prevention this we, this is what we advise every patient who undergo uh, mrm to keep uh, her hand abducted and elevated to prevent this uh, development of lymphedema okay and uh, to Uh, avoid this uh, trauma injection and blood pressure uh, blood pressure measurement is affected our sun sauna steam should be elevated and protect hand from this uh, injury use gloves use thimble okay avoid tight clothing surgical uh, prevention is done by axillary reverse mapping and 
leukovenous anastomosis and central lymphoid biopsy. This is vascular lymph node transfer where the, the lymph node is taken from the uh, uh, from one of the area and then uh, anastomos either for growing or from the uh, from the neck and then anastomos to the limb. So this will drain the lymphatic drainage. This is liposuction. This is excision. Okay, so those were the uh, management of lymphedema. Now, pregnancy associated breast cancer, there is a late presentation as it is masked. There is delay in diagnosis. Ultrasonography is better because uh, the breast is dense. The biology is higher grade. Okay, prognosis and management is same, but uh, pregnancy should be avoided for two years. This is a male breast and uh, gynecomastia. This is the grading which is known as Simon classification of gynecomastia. There is one sign which is seen in uh, gynecomastia known as flame sign. Okay, these are the risk factors for uh, gynecomastia like uh, leprosy, clinical syndrome, okay, teratoma. So this is the flame sign I was talking about. You can see this is, appears as a flame and that is flame sign seen on mammography in case of gynecomastia. Which of the following is false statement regarding male breast cancer? So most of the male breast cancer are hormone negative. Negative <coughs> is the wrong concept because because male breast cancer has paradoxically more hormone receptor positive. Okay, so the incidence is less than one percent. These are the risk factors for a male breast cancer. And as I said, the female is more than hundred times at risk of breast cancer than the male. And the male usually have a median age later than the female. That is, their median age is 60, while a female has median age of 53. The treatment is a mastectomy. Okay, there is no role of BCS in case of male breast cancer. And tamoxifen is given if it is hormone receptor positive. These are the landmark trials by Fisher et al. NSABP, who is the father of the NSABP, Fisher et al. And you can go through if you are preparing for INI SS. Okay. Nipple benign disorder. We all know milk line. Uh, this is milk line of skulls. Uh, uh, and the nipple can be uh, either uh, simple nipple inversion or recent pathological uh, nipple inversion based on uh, doctor ectasia or periductal mastitis is slit like. Okay. And circumferential when it is many uh, next. Yes. Uh, patient disease is important because. Uh, questions are asked, uh, and in fact, in the recent uh, uh, recent um, INISS, which was asked, I'll be telling what was the question. It is less than one percent of the breast malignancy. First, derived by PZ. Okay, there are two two th theories: inter-epidermal theory and epidermal th theory. What does that mean? Means the tumor is beginning in the epidermis, and then it is going inside the breast camera. This is one intra-epidermal. Second is epidermotropic tropic theory means the tumor is inside the breast parenchyma and then it is going into the epidermis. Usually in breast cancer, it is intraepidermal theory, uh, sorry, uh, epidermot epidermotropic uh, theory, but in case of CA vulva, it is intraepidermal theory. Okay, CA vulva. There is also, uh, it is not like a PJS disease is only in the breast, okay. Pager disease, uh, memory can be memory or extra memory. Memory is uh, seen in breast, and extra memory most common is vulva. So 80% it is memory pagers, and 20% it is uh, extra memory pagers, which is CA vulva. So the clinical features is nipple erythema, uh, irritation with um, associated pruritus, crusting, and ulceration. It can be benign, uh, spread to the uh, skin of the areola, while eczema. It is from areola to nipple, but here it will be from nipple to areola, okay. And it is uh, unilateral, can be examined bilateral, old age, and page jaha. Yes, this was the question. Page disease can be accompanied by a palpable mass in more than 50%. Okay, page disease, palpable mass in 50%. While, while invasive, uh, it is associated with invasive cancer in 90%. EPI, page disease, palpable mass in 50%, and invasive cancer in 90%. So uh, investigations we have mammogram, MRI, okay, and the biopsy of the nipple, pager cell. What is pager cell? It is large pair, PS positive cell. Treatment uh, we'll do uh, historically. Uh, we'll do uh, it was mastectomy, but uh, breast conservation surgery with whole breast DSDSN is another uh, treatment modality. 
sentinel lymph node biopsy and means axillary lymph node management is done if there is invasive component otherwise um, and it is not done and adjuvant chemotherapy based on hpr and adjuvant rt if local excision is done so this is ncm guideline almost same what i told you so what is a pathological nipple discharge uh, is characterized by all of the following except as i said pathological nipple discharge in 4s single side single duct single spontaneous and and serosaminous so multiple duct is the wrong answer or is pathological nipple discharge so this is belly taken from belly the question starter r is in which uh, of the following disease there is green nipple discharge it was ductic taxia and serous miss uh, serous discharge fibrocystid all these two questions are asked this is also asked all these three questions have been asked in neat heart failure operation is used for i think uh, we often tend to get confused uh, between this uh, two surgery heart failure operation uh, uses the periorular incision okay so we take uh, peri we make periorular incision and that we uh, and this is the racket incision okay this is the racket incision and this is the steward incision which is horizontal incision so periorular incision is used in case of heart failure operation so heart failure is major duct excision where we remove all duct that are there while micro ductectomy we remove uh, we give tennis uh, racket incision and we will remove the duct that is pathological okay so so we should not get confused between heart failure and micro ductectomy now which of the following is a true statement regarding a benign breast disease so the answer is c polymegia happens at a growing thigh and buttocks is true statement because the milk line goes to that through that okay Uh, these are several benign breast diseases the congenital the mastitis of infants diffuse hypertrophy okay uh, traumatic uh, hematoma and uh, chronic fat necrosis this is the bacterial uh, mastitis and we have antibiotic as the main uh, modality of treatment all of the following are uh, true about a mondus disease except so b surgery is generally required after the acute process result in fact surgery is not required at all in this kind of disease we need to just restrict the arm movement this is the mondus divin this is the clinical picture is taken from belly and it is basically thrombophlebitis of the superficial veins of breast and head chest and arm this seems to be easy but uh, but questions are framed as uh, from this particular uh, mondus disease uh, there was uh, some questions i i went uh, across thrombosis of pitone is called like a, st a structure and is very painful so we have to give arm Uh, arm uh, rest and uh, an SAID. Which of the following uh, statement is true regarding A and D? I. So papillomatosis is an extreme form of epitheliosis. Is the correct extreme? This is beautiful table taken from uh, Swart. So you can uh, understand the entire spectrum of A and D. I. That is aberration in normal development and involution. How it is normal? How <coughs> what if uh, there is a uh, Uh, disorder and when do we call it a disease like the normal uh, uh, lobular development uh, then the disorder is fibroadenoma and the disease is dent fibroadenoma so the question can be formulated anyway like uh, like i can formulate a question dent fibroadenoma is uh, is it occurs in involution is late reproductive years okay is a disorder is a disease so the question can be framed with any permutation and combination important table must follow So duct ectasia and periductal mastitis a very good pathophysiology is that first there is dilatation of the duct the it will fill with excretion and there will be nistful discharge and that will irritate and uh, cause inflammation that will result in abscess of fistula formation subarylar mass and there will be nipple retraction more common in patients who are diabetic and smoking treatment uh, first exclude carcinoma give antibiotic metronidazole and heart failure uh, procedure that is excision of all major ducts while microdopectomy will remove single duct single pathological duct this is anti classification given by a cardiac breast clinic so so they have they have given the four pathology the cyst formation fibrosis epithelial hyperplasia papillomatosis 
and uh, and uh, cyclical mastalgia we want to live uh, in aims uh, they are asked how do we manage this uh, cyclical mastalgia so i have kept this table taken from belly so it is the denazole tam uh, tamoxifen evening primrose oil okay and t syndrome is closest differential diagnosis for uh, cyclical mastalgia the breast cyst is another andi fibroadenoma we all know it is Hyperplasia of a single lobule and it is encapsulated. We call it giant fibroadenoma when it is more than five centimeter. So, which of the following statement is a true regarding serocystic disease of um, Brody? That is filoid. So, treatment is by mastectomy for malignant type. So, filoid is a very important topic. Um, it is also known as serocystic disease of um, Brody and uh, sarcoma. Uh, it is basically sarcoma of breast. Okay, so the way we treat extremity sarcoma, the, it behaves similarly. So usually more than forty years, <coughs> postulated surface, the, uh, the prominence of veins, ulceration due to places on necrosis, mammography we say uh, we also round density on ultrasonography. There there will be cystic spaces, low grade and like fibroadenoma to sarcomatous changes there and three times benign, borderline malignant. So margin should be adequate. I have seen a patient with even with filoid coming uh, recurrent uh, with recurrence. So the margin should be in fact there should be more uh, gross grossly not margin should be taken two centimeter more than the invasive ductal cancer. And uh, the most common site of disturbance is lung, not like not bone in case of breast cancer it is bone, but lungs in case of filoid just like sarcoma. And the chance of exhilarating mets is uh, less than five percent. Chemotherapy uh, similar to sarcoma. And RT is given when the margin is closed, when cyst fossa is involved, and tumor is more than five centimeters. The problem is that when we, most of the uh, general surgeon will uh, just excise the filoid and <coughs> do not care for margin. So once the margin is positive, there is a high chance of recurrence. So in that case, RT should be given. So this is the incision guideline. How to this basically same thing in a in a, 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 a flowchart form. So all of the following statements are true regarding risk of malignancy in benign conditions. This is basically uh, from a DuPont phase classification, which is uh, uh, true, which is false statement. So here 1.5 times with apocrine metaplasia. So the word will sound like it is a very grave disorder, but uh, it has no risk of malignancy. So apocrine and metaplasia, you can see there is no increased risk of malignancy. So this is the DuPont and phase classification. And here at the position in the previous slide, we, 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 we went across that is severe, severe hyperplasia is the hyperplasia with no atypia. Okay, so the, at least remember these, uh, these uh, risk, uh, slightly increased risk, moderate risk, and then you will be able to uh, know the incre no increased risk as well. So uh, I think I have summarized all these and um, if you have any question, you can put in the demo group for those who are unpaid members and the paid member will be given access to premium group. They will be given access to all those recordings, class PPT, slides and the question bank that we have. And, um, and of course the mock test that is done every month. So if you have any question, you can ask me. Otherwise, uh, we'll conclude the session. The recording will be provided only to the paid members. Okay.
okay we'll share share the link of the recording the demo group